Welcome to Diffuse Congruence, the American Muslim Experience. This is episode 108. I'm Omar Ansari, your co-host, and as usual, I am joined by Perez Zephyr. Hey, welcome back, listeners. Uh, welcome back. Uh, we uh, This isn't our first episode of 2021, but uh, it feels like a lot's already happened <laughs> in this very short year uh, or short-lived year uh, so far. Uh, we've gone through a lot, but here we are. Um, good to be back and good to be back with you, Omar. How are, how are, how are things? Uh, I guess all things being equal, uh, uh, all else being equal. Yeah. Things are okay. Um, have some family members who are affected by COVID, unfortunately. So I'm praying for them. Um, uh, but other than that, things are, things are okay. You know, just, uh, just chugging along. I mean, try not to get. Try not to get too distracted by the, poli- the political stuff and you know, keeping an eye on it. Super interesting. Uh, but yeah. other than that, just getting back in the swing of things in, in life. And uh, and then, of course, just keeping an eye on the family members who are, who, uh, who are uh, um, you know, in, in their situation. So, yeah, I, I mean, interesting uh, about the political stuff uh, being kind of uh, the uh, least of all adjectives as we can describe it. But uh, anyway, we're super excited um, to have um, our guest on the show today. And uh, Omer, if you want to yeah, do the honors and absolutely. welcome our guest. Yeah. Absolutely. Welcome, Sana. Sana Saeed is a host and senior producer who has been with AJ Plus since 2014, uh, helping launch the channel. She's a Canadian who spent most of her life in the U.S. and is interested in politics, religion, culture, and uh, she works very hard to stay out of arguments on Twitter. Uh, she has a background in media critique and analysis and has had work in appear in the New York Times, the LA Times, Quartz, The Guardian, Salon, and of course, AJE. So welcome, Senna. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Happy to be here. Yeah, it's great. And uh, uh, so, so you avoid Twitter fights. That 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 defeats the whole purpose <laughs> of having you on the show. I, I mean, uh, <laughs> you should have told us that when we were booking. No, I'm, I'm, I'm joking. I'm I said I tried to. I didn't yeah. say I'm successful at avoiding Twitter fights. That's right. Um, I'm relatively new to Twitter and... Um, I've unfortunately gone off on the deep end and uh, but which is some of the stuff I'd love to talk to you about as someone who uh, obviously studies media is involved in media and uh, I'm sure uh, social media being a part of that. So um, but yeah, I guess before we get into that meteor stuff, uh, not to say that um, will be what I do want to start off with is not meaty, uh, but uh, I'd love to kind of talk about your background and as we like to call it, the origin story. So tell us about Sana Saeed's origin story. And uh, well, yeah, we'd love to hear that. I, I know that you did spend some time in the Bay Area. So I'm, uh, I know that's where our paths crossed. Um, however, I know there's so much more to the story. We'd love to hear that. Yeah. And, and you can start way back as, uh, as early as, you, as you'd like. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I was actually born in Pakistan. I was born in Lahore. And uh, my family background is uh, we're ethnically Kashmiri um, and we're like, we're, so we are like, you know, there are a lot of uh, Kashmiris who are in Pakistan who are in Punjab as well. So we're like the Punjabified Kashmiris, but like my family is extreme, has actually retained a lot of Kashmiri customs and identity. And it's been, that's always been really interesting the way we kind of um, have balanced those two identities very strongly. Um, And like uh, my family also immigrated uh, from Kashmir basically uh, like a little bit before and during the, um, uh, uh, the partition. uh, partition. Yeah. During the partition. So um, yeah, I was born in in Pakistan and uh, when I was about like four or five months old, my parents, um, my dad had already moved uh, at that point. He had moved to the United States to kind of uh, like take the family business there. Uh, And uh, my mom and I followed suit. And in uh, 1980, yeah, it was 87, 88, we were in, uh, in New York. So, and I was in New York for basically, up until the end of 1999, early 2000. So I grew up in uh, initially Flushing, Queens, and then eventually to uh, moved on to um, uh, Long Island, Port Washington, Long Island, which is where I grew up. Um, and yeah, and basically, so we didn't have citizenship. The only person in my family who has U.S. citizenship is actually my brother since he was born there. So we then applied for Canadian citizenship and ended up in Canada um and moved to vancouver i was there for uh, up until i had to go to college then i moved to montreal i went to mcgill where i did um uh i i for my undergrad i studied political science and middle east studies and then i continued on 
I had to kind of decide, I'm like, do I want to do law school? Do I want to do grad school? I ended up applying to only one law school and one grad school. And because my French fluency at that point was not that great, I ended up not getting into the McGill Law School because they do require French fluency. So um, I went to grad school and I did Islamic studies. And that was, um, to be honest, it was the greatest blessing. And it was the greatest blessing, not because, oh, you know, you're studying Islam, except it was a blessing because... Um, doing that master's program really kind of set the stage for, I would say, my approach to journalism. I didn't go to J school, right? Journalism school, which is, I think most people, you know, yesterday I was doing another interview and, and, and you know, he said, well, you, you studied journalism. And I said, no, I actually didn't study journalism. I studied history. Right. You know, um, and oh. so... Sorry. How common is that? You think like, meaning, I mean, there's so many questions I want to ask just based on what you already said, but just picking up on that last point, um, you know, in your profession uh, or, you know, it coming across the people that you do in your professional life, your colleagues, you know, how many of them have actually studied, you know, or gone to J school, studied journalism, or they kind of fall into it by way of either law or history or other profession or other um, academic pursuits? I would say the major, like the vast, vast, overwhelming majority of people who I have worked with, who I have, sorry, let me repeat. <clears throat> so I would say that the vast majority of people who I have worked with, um, people I've come across, I've networked with, I know in the industry, uh, they've gone to J school, right? So they have that background. Um, very few people that I've actually come across uh, don't. Um, not, that's not to say, you know, there are, there are people who've gone to J school, but they've also done other degrees, right? So maybe they have a law degree or they have a medical degree, who knows, or some, something else. Um, and that does exist, but most people in my personal experience, um, have gone to J school. So that was always kind of like a, for a very long time, it was kind of a weird situation for me because again, my, my background training was in history and I've been interested in in media critique and the way we talk about things, right? For a very, very, very long time. Like since I was basically since 2001, you know, uh, so, you know, seeing the way in which since then in particular, um, you know, I was brought into a new consciousness. It was a very formative time. I was like, what, like 13, 14 years old. So, um, you know, it was a, a period in my life where I was seeing the way in which very familiar ideas and beliefs and things that I knew were being portrayed in a way that I didn't recognize, like about Islam, about Muslims, about brown men, about brown women. And I'm like, I bought the hijab and all these things. And I'm like, I don't understand this. And that was a really, you know, kind of a pivotal period in my life. It was extremely formative because I saw the, I saw the power of, of the story. I saw the power of propaganda. I saw the power of getting the story wrong and whether that could result in laws that were suppressing the speech of people that were getting people rounded up and thrown, you know, and detained and thrown into prisons and their families not knowing where they were from that to like, I saw the power of how that propaganda, the story could lead to, uh, you know, uh, lead to war and occupation of other lands and other people. And so, um, you know, at a very, very, very young age, like many other people, I mean, I'm not unique in this, in this front at all, but I really learned and understood like there's power in how we tell a story and why we tell a story and, and how that can ultimately humanize and dehumanize people, but also how that dehumanization or humanization can lead to policy changes that have material impact on um, human life that have an actual impact on human life. And so for me, it was like, I, from a very young age, I'd been thinking, I guess, like a journalist, so to speak, right. I'm thinking about, you know, how are we talking about a story? How is this story constructed? Who's telling the story? What are the sources? Because again, at a very young age, I had to become a critical and engaged and active news consumer. And I was like mm -hmm. 13, 14 years old. So in a way I'm like, sure, I didn't have your traditional training, but I had, I had the training of the Bush years, you know what I mean? You were in New York. <laughs> you were in New York. At that, right? point, so. you know, at, that point, at that point I was in Canada. So, cause we moved in 2000, right? Right before everything went down in New York. Right. And, and for me, like, honestly, like it was, you know, 
like Peter Jennings was like absolutely a massive influence in me because of just like the, the, the power that man held in telling us, telling stories every single night in 2001 in particular. Um, yeah, seriously. You know, like really just, I felt like kept everyone together, no matter where you fell in terms of like how you identified or what, like that man really had this power to, to yeah, hold us all together in a, in a weird way. Um, I agree. I agree. There was something, I mean, you know, like we grew up in a generation where, you know, it wasn't just the Walter Cronkite, you know, where we had one voice, it, you know, we, we, we sort of had the choice between the, um, I guess the, well, looking at the three major cable networks or, or sorry, the, the major networks, um, ABC, CBS, and NBC, it was like Brokaw, it was uh, uh, Peter Jennings or it was um, um, Dan, Rather. Dan Rather. Yeah, Dan Rather. And, uh, you know, my family, we just grew up uh, consuming Peter Jennings and he was kind of our Walter Cronkite. And so when, yeah, on the day of 9-11, I just remember being fixated and just watching ABC and just watching Dan Rather. Oh, sorry, Peter Jennings kind of, you know, uh help us process what was happening right and and so he was he was really a master i always say like in a way like peter jennings allowed me to be able to cry because mm. when it happened like i remember i woke up that morning and um it was funny because like i guess i heard my mom talking about you know when you're in that weird stage of sleep where like you're half in half out where you're awake but not awake and so in my dreams i it was like i i heard that there was a plane crash or whatever and then i actually woke up to get ready for school and i know like my mom didn't wake me up and she always wakes me up and my brother was still asleep and i'm like what's going on like why is my mom waking me up and the house was dark like i remember our apartment rather was dark and i'm like this is weird like this is not normal i got to go to school in like you know 45 minutes like what's going on Mm-hmm. And I walked over to my mom's room and she was ironing like our clothes and she was quiet and she was just staring at the TV. And I was like, what's going on? She's like, um, New York's under attack. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And I look at the screen. It's just like people running and whatever. This is before the second, um, Got it. second plane hit. So I, she's like, we don't know what's going on. I'm like, whoa. That, and it didn't really hit me at that point. I'm like, whoa, that's crazy. Like that's, that's how I felt. I was like, oh, that's, that's so crazy. Like, I just thought it was like a, I don't know, like a TWA situation. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. like I didn't think about what it was that we were seeing at the time. My mom had already been watching the news for a while. And my mom is like, she is such a New Yorker, even though we've been out of, out of New York now for um, 20, more than 20 years, but like, she's such a New Yorker to this day. And so she was just like, so kind of enraptured by it. I got ready. I went to school and, you know, like, I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know. And then all of a sudden, you know, and, and, right. and, and people were like speculating, what could it be? And then the second plane hit. Mm-hmm. And they told us in school, um, like, hey, this has happened. Uh, and actually, I remember they set up a TV, like our gym, one of our gym teachers set up a TV. And he's like, if you want to come watch the news, I thought it was really interesting that they were allowing us to do this. Um, that they allowed us to do that. And I remember we watched the news. And as the, as the day went on, and as also the next day went on as well, you know, a lot of Islamophobic stuff was starting to be said, right? And I remember my French teacher, I'll never forget it. My French teacher started saying like, the most rabid, like just, I don't even want to repeat it, just Islamophobic stuff. And I just kind of sat there and, you know, I felt like immediately I had to be on the defensive, right? Here I am a 14 year old kid and I'm on the defensive and I'm like, I don't want to defend people. Obviously like I'm not going to offend these people, but like I had to be on defensive about my faith and I wore hijab. So like I was very much so, you know, um, uh, very explicitly, you know, almost all of a sudden the other, uh, more so than usual to, to everyone there. And so, like, I felt like I couldn't mourn the city I had grown up in, right? Like, I couldn't mourn the city I had grown up in. I couldn't mourn what had happened because I was on the defensive. And I felt like when I went home then and we were watching Peter Jennings night after night, I think I just remember crying one of those nights finally because I felt a permission. Not that I needed it, but I did feel like a permission finally to, like, allow myself to cry. And with all the emotions, it wasn't just the emotions of what had happened, but just, like, knowing that it was going to be very different now. Right. Like it was going to be very, very different um, in many different ways now. Like we just knew it, it was going to be different. Yeah. Um, no, absolutely. Um, and it was, <laughs> you know, it was, it was obviously you, you, you were uh, prescient in that regard. Um, I, I want to go back to also something you said earlier, which, which sort of, you know, caught my attention, which was that your, um, you know, 
going to grad school and studying Islamic studies prepared you for a career in journalism. Um, one, I'm curious, did you go to grad school or did you do your MA in Islamic studies at McGill? Yes. So okay. I did. Um, yeah, I ended up staying at McGill. Was uh, was Professor Wael Halak there? Oh, or? oh, you're about to bring up my favorite human being. <laughs> okay. Oh, great. great. I, I, I'm I, a huge. I took- <laughs> yeah. I, I'm a huge, but and, and and I don't know if you know this. So I I I went to grad school in Islamic studies as well, um, and and uh, yeah, uh, Michigan. And um, I um, obviously while Halak was part of our syllabus, uh, you know, um, Dr. Jackson's classes uh, and a lot of others that I took. So yeah, I'd love to hear about that. That's because for, for <laughs> me, he's like a giant in the field, and so. I don't, yeah. oh man, I don't know if I can share this story because, like, I feel like if by any chance he ever heard this story, I mean, he knows it because he, I, he, well, we'd be honored if he listened to this podcast, but oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if it ever got back to him. Um, so yeah, no, while I absolutely love, I love him. And I think I have that appreciation of, I'm, I'm like literally looking right now. I have a pile of, I own probably almost every single one of his books. I haven't yeah. read every single one of them, but I like, have, I, cause you know, his like writing is very dense. He is. It a, is very dense writer and it's just like whoo this is like i read a few pages i'm like i'm gonna need a minute i need a minute to like understand <laughs> what i just read right and um so so i i i appreciate him not for the work that not only for the work that he puts out um but because i took a class with him and uh it was just basic you know your introduction to islamic law and i think almost as an undergrad or as a grad as student undergrad, as an undergrad student i took it um and um i I will say that like that class and it's not just me. I think most, many people who were taking those classes would say like that, that class was life changing. Mm-hmm. Like, and I don't take the, I don't like say that lightly or even to be dramatic, but it truly was life changing because through him, I was able and through that class. And, and um, we also had um, uh, um, a great, he's now a professor, Walter Edwards, I believe um, who was, uh, I hope I'm getting his name right right now. Um, uh, but uh, both of them basically allowed us to, I'm oh, sorry, uh, his name is um, Edward Walter, uh, Walter Edward Young. That's his full name. He's a professor now, incredible, also um, a scholar. But through them, we were able to, um, I was able to get tools of, of historical understanding and context and a way of thinking outside of my very limited kind of um, scope of like how to understand history. And until that point, I did not realize, this is like 2007, I think I took the class with him, um, 2007, 2008. And I think I didn't realize, even though for all my like anti-colonial talk and whatnot at that point, mm-hmm. I didn't realize how much of actually what I still believed and knew was still very extremely within the confines of a Eurocentric um, uh, historical narrative, right? Uh, and the language that I was using. And I think like Halak helped me and and, and, and Walter, they both, uh, Walter Young, both helped me uh, get the tools to kind of start dissecting that a little in myself, right? In terms of like, how are we talking about these things? How do you understand your own religion, right? Mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. I didn't realize that there were certain certain ways that I was understanding my own religion that um, were very much so coming through an Orientalist lens. Mm. Um, and so I'm always forever grateful for that because I think that in so many ways, like that class also just strengthened, strengthened my belief, which I, which is not what I expected. Right. I didn't expect to walk away with like a stronger Iman um, from, from this class that I was taking. I agree. And, and, and for a lot of people, you know, um, they either have uh, opposite experiences or there's a perception that if you, if you study Islam or, you know, study Islam at, from an academic level, uh, especially at a Western institution that you're going to leave, you know, more, um, you know, like basically questioning one's faith and and struggling where, and so to, to hear your experiences and, and frankly, my experience is very much echo yours, which is that it strengthened my own appreciation and faith, um, you know, in a way that I think that had I studied even in a quote unquote traditional setting, that wouldn't have been the case. So um, I agree. However, the perception is kind of the opposite, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think it's also important to remember. So this is like 2007, 2008. And 
at that time, it didn't feel as though as much as at that time, I really wanted to go and study Islam, like in a traditional setting, but it didn't feel like I wanted to better my Arabic, even though my Arabic skills were awful. Like I, I only learn language if I'm like in the situation, like I, I can't just learn from books. Immersive. Like, yeah. I have to, it has to be completely immersive. Mm-hmm. So, but at that time, like, I think pe- sometimes people don't realize this, like just, it wasn't that long ago that it didn't like, you know, people talk about a lack of accessibility today. I'm like, no, it's actually far more accessible in terms of like traditional scholarship today in terms of all the institutes we have, even like Kalam Institute, like I just off the top of my head, right? Like these institutes, like I'm like, I don't, I, I don't remember having access to anything to traditional knowledge as a woman in particular, like back then. Right. It was just, it seemed, and especially like, especially being the type of woman that I was like in a sense of very, very outspoken and really politically active. And, you know, even though, even if I was wearing hijab, it was like, well, it's so like different that you're doing like politics and like, you're so active, but you wear hijab. It was like, what? Like, why is that? What, like, this is so weird. <laughs> like, like, why is that an issue? But, you know, um, it wasn't that long ago, but it, so for me, like doing that, mm-hmm. You know, because I always get that a lot, like, oh, but you studied Islam, like, in a in a secular institution. I'm like, yeah, and absolutely, and I can recognize the the kind of um, the uh, the obstacles that exist there, right? And I also, at the same time, and am, am humble enough to know that I don't know everything when it comes to you know Islamic history and Islamic law, et cetera, et cetera. But I was very blessed to have some professors during my undergrad and my grad experience who treated Islam not as always a subject to be studied, but really something more personal and intimate, right? Like I give another example, like obviously while Halak is like one of the best examples and I'll get back to like a really juicy story with him. But um, uh, there was another professor, Robert Wisnowski, and uh, he's amazing. He's like, uh, he's absolutely, I think one of the most incredible um, scholars I've, I've come across and he uh, he, he focuses on Kalam and uh, did a lot on Al-Ghazali and um, Ibn Sina. And, uh, you know, I, I, took, I took a class with him in undergrad and during undergrad. And I remember, I swear, I've never seen anyone do this. Like not even, not even like Muslims do this. He, he said, you know, at the very first class, there were a lot of us Muslims in that class as well. And he said, I just want to say that, you know, for any Muslims in this class, um, I want to give a bit of a disclaimer, right? And I want to give you a warning. This class is going to be going through Kalam, which is like, you know, um, we're going to be uh, going through issues of, of faith, of, 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 of belief. And we'll be asking some questions that absolutely have the power to rock your belief system and what you believe already and so on and so forth. And you'll be questioning those things and showing you debates that you may not have known existed. So I just want you to know that this is what to expect in this class. And I didn't appreciate it in the beginning when he's like, I, I, mean, I didn't like not appreciate it. I was like, how could you say that? I was like, okay, that's kind of weird, whatever. But as the class went on and we delved into these questions and I learned about like all these debates about like the createdness of the Quran. And I was like, wait, what? Like, what is all this? Like, you know, um, stuff that you as a lay Muslim just don't know about. And in a way, I think that's also a blessing because these things absolutely, like a lot of traditional scholars will tell you, like when you start getting into these issues of Kalam, of theology and these debates, it absolutely can rock your faith because then you can leave at the end of the day saying, I don't, I don't know what I believe. Right. And so the fact that this professor, right, this non-Muslim professor started off by giving us a warning and a, and a qualification that a lot of Islamic scholars will sometimes give you as well is like, you know, a testament to the, like to some of the people who educated me. Right. Like it really, like, I'm like, that, that's, that's what my education was like, where people really treated this not as like a, I mean, and there were, don't get me wrong. There were professors who were treating Islam and Muslims as a subject. And so being a visible Muslim in this Institute and in this like field was weird. And it still is weird. Like I have a lot of opinions on the way we study Islam and talk about Islamic studies, quote unquote, Middle East studies, all that stuff. I have a lot to say about that, but I think, I think like I was very, very blessed in the type of education I received and what I was able to take from it. And because of that, I was able to, because I learned, and by the way, like Islamic studies, like people don't realize it's interdisciplinary. So you get anthropology, you get history, you get politics, you get law, you get everything. And so by the time I was in grad school, I was in three hour seminars 
where, which by the way, I did something, I would never recommend going straight from undergrad to grad school because it just, it's, and the Islamic Studies Institute at McGill is, is very, it's tough. It's not yeah. easy. Right. And I was, I was in classes with PhD students who were absolutely brilliant. And I was bringing undergrad habits into a grad school. So it wasn't a very smart thing to do. And it took me like a little while to really shape up, but, and it was tough. Like the, that, the, the training they give you is tough. And so I was getting this interdisciplinary education where I was, you know, able to study ideas about law, about which I was already interested in and had kind of studied a little bit in my undergrad about law, about, you know, understanding post-colonial theory, about anthro theory, which I didn't even know was a thing. And then sociology. And I was because of that and because of my interest in, again, how do we tell stories? How are we creating narratives, which was actually a huge part of also a lot of the classes I was taking. It prepared me beautifully for journalism. And we can come back to that after as well, but it really did prepare me beautifully for journalism and equipping me with tools in recognizing like, you know, again, like what is a strong story? What is a story and how is it like dehumanizing or humanizing people? Like, so that I can read something about even a a region I'm unfamiliar with and still be able to pick out problems in that story. Right. Right. No, thank you for uh, remembering to address that part of the question. Um, I, I kind of got lost in just hearing you. No, just hearing you talk about your experiences because uh, not only did it kind of reminded me uh, remind me of my graduate uh, days uh, or days in grad school, but also I think you, you mentioned a very it, it, a very important point, which is people don't realize, especially I think in the area studies approach to Islamic studies, right? Because a lot of people, again, when you when you look at academic, when you look at Islam and academic institutions, Western academic institutions, you either approach it through a um, uh, an area studies, i.e. Near Eastern, Middle Eastern, perhaps even South Asian studies, or you approach it from a religious studies uh, perspective, which is probably not, and I don't, I, I, I can't speak to it because those weren't my experiences, but probably not as interdisciplinary as I think some of the things that you're mentioning in an area studies um, kind of discipline, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, or approach to Islamic studies. Um, but no, thank you for sharing that. Um, although you did, you, you did promise and tease a juicy <laughs> story, uh, but I'll leave it. I'll, I'll let you decide whether you. Yeah, no, no, I'll, I'll share it because I, I think it's a hilarious story. And it, I mean, it's, it's, it's immature, and but we, it was like, it's no, like no, my please do. story. Please do. But before, but, I, and at the same time, I want, I do want to kind of get back to like transitioning away from your, your experiences at McGill, but if you could also kind of touch on, well, actually, you know what, I'll, I'll let you tell your story. And then I have a real quick question about McGill and then I think Umar has something to ask you. So yeah, why don't we, why don't we do that in that order? Yeah, sounds great. So uh, the thing about Halak is that now I was what, like I guess it was like 2007, 2008, I think I was in his class. And I was in it with my best friends, which is always a recipe for disaster. Like do not <laughs> with your best. And it's a small class. It's not a big class. Um, right. And, uh, and so we, we were, we were absolutely enamored by Halak. Like we, he's a very charming man. And so we were just like, oh, like when he first walked into class, we were like, oh, who is this man? <laughs> like, you know, he can be our father, but damn, like, who is this man? And then, of course, as the class continues, he's like, basically every class that he gave was like, think about the best khutbah you've ever heard in your life. Like that really, like when you left that khutbah, you were like, I'm about to go give some sadaqa. I'm about to like, re- like complete change my life. That's what every class of his felt like. Right? Re- it really did. Like we would leave and we're like, wow. So we were like, and again, it's a small class. It's about like maybe 20 people. So we would be sitting in the back, me and my best friend, um, who he actually adored, which really broke my heart. Um, I was like, why her and not me? But um, uh, cause he's still like, if I, if I reach out to him today, he'll still ask me how she's doing. And I'm like, damn, a lot. like that's cold. But um, <laughs> you know, we would, be in the back. we would be sitting in the back and we'd just be like, Oh my God, look at him. Like, it was so, it was so ridiculous. It was like the stuff, like 19 year old, you know, 20 year old girls just being so stupid. And we thought we were being so slick. We're whispering, you know, da da da, whatever. And yeah. we, every class we would do it. And then at one point, one of my friends who sat in the front of the class, she was like, you guys are so loud. I was like, wait, what? She's like, you guys are so loud. Like you're always talking about how you're in love with him. I was like, wait, what? And I was like, well, hopefully he doesn't hear Cause he never seems to react. Like it's all good. It's all good. So after the class ended, I would go visit. Of course I would go visit Halak. Right. I'm like, hi, hi professor. Um, and I actually was visiting cause I was very, um, I wanted to do my master's with him. 
I was like, it, I would lo- I love to do, you know, continue studying with you. And he actually gave me some incredible, to be honest, he gave me incredible advice just on life. Cause he was telling me I used to do activism when he was a young Palestinian student. And like, he just gave me incredible advice on just life and academia and all that. Um, but uh, and he, at, at one point he told me, he was like, look, like I'm actually going to be probably taking a job at Columbia and I'm only doing PhD students. So like, if you want to do that, um, you know, think about doing a PhD. He's like, I love you as a student. I was like, Oh my God. Oh my God. Although I'm like, I think he was just trying to be nice. Cause I know he has like really strict requirements about like his students. Like you have to speak the most beautiful and perfect, like uh, classical Quranic Arabic and Fusha has to be perfect and all this. I'm like, yeah, that's not going to be me. So, um, so anyway, so as I'm talking to him and we're, we were kind of reminiscing, this is like about, a, a, like about a year after I'd taken the class with him and, um, he was talking to me about the class that I was in and he was like, you know, I had some, you know, basically he was saying how some of the students there actually really gave him a hard time. Right. Like, and he was just discussing that with me. And, uh, and I said, I'm like, well, don't worry. Some of us actually really loved you in that class. Like we really adored you. And he blushed and he said, yes, I, I heard, I, I could hear you clearly. And I was like, Oh my God. I was like, oh my God. He's like, I heard you the whole week. I was like, oh my God, this is the most. I'm like, okay, but how do you feel about that? Like, let me know. I know Halak. Like, what's the deal? What you know? It was anyway, so that's my Juicy Halak story. <laughs> that's hilarious. You know, I, I keep thinking of that scene and like uh, and Omar will appreciate this and, and maybe you too, Sana, but like uh it's reminding me of like uh I think it's Raiders of the Lost Ark and and you've got all the right, you've got all the female students and they're all like just just yes. totally in love with Dr. Henry Jones. Jones Jr. Yes, uh, that, that's Jr. pretty much that's pretty much it. Like it was <laughs> it was so it was so crazy. Like and then the fact that by the way, I, so I can say that I made Halak blush. I can I can say like there I you go. Two, two incredible men blush, and one of them is uh, is uh, is Wild Halak. I'm like I'm very proud of that. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll ask you later who the other man is. No, I'm, I'm joking. Um, uh, uh, real quick. Fun. It was Shah Rukh Khan. Oh, I wow. That. You have a Shah Rukh Khan story too. So we, we yeah. definitely have to come back to that. Um, you know I think this will be the share, first time. I say just share that story. Share the Shah Rukh Khan story. Yeah, yeah, there you go. The It'll definitely be a first on this podcast that we've had a Shah Rukh Khan story. So please <laughs> indulge us. I indulge love, us all. I love sharing the story because I'm like, look, I don't, I'm not the type of person who ever name drops, but I will name drop Shah Rukh Khan because this is like, it was a great moment in like my life and also my mother's life, even though she wasn't there. <laughs> She was like, oh, my God. Um, but basically, so in 2017, Shah Rukh Khan came to San Francisco. And he was here for the uh, San Francisco Film Festival. And me and two other, like, Daisy girls in the Asia Plus office were like, uh, we need to get there. We need to get a press pass, baby. Like, we need to make this happen. <laughs> we got a press pass. And Asia Plus was like, um, what are we going to do with Shah Rukh Khan? We're like, we'll figure it out. Do not worry. Like, we will make a story. And so we got a press pass. We like decked out in our best, right? Like our, our professional best, but also like, you know, had a little, little bit of like uh, South Asian jewelry going on and whatnot. We're like, okay, we're here to represent. And we get there. And by the way, I don't know if you guys remember this, but like it was at the Castro Theater and it was like the people who worked there, we were, we were speaking with them. They're like, we've never seen anything like this because South Asians, like literally half of the subcontinent showed up because they knew Shah Rukh Khan was coming. Like literally they were overflowing and and it was funny because one of the women there, she was like, you know, we had Ryan Gosling here last week and it was pretty crazy, but it was nothing like this. I'm like, yeah, because it's (laughs) Ryan Gosling. Like, yeah, Ryan Gosling's great, but like, I'm sorry, this Shah Rukh Khan, this guy's huge. And also there's like over 1 billion South Asians. You can't compete. So um, anyway, so we, we went into like the, um, the press area and the way that they have it set up is like everyone's in a line and then Shah Rukh, like, you know, when he would come in, he would have, he would, he talks to each, individual i mean it's just like you've seen like a red carpet event right he's talking to each individual um uh press uh, uh or, or company media company by itself so this man walks in and let me tell you like I, I you know obviously growing up i mean i have my own issues with bollywood now but like growing up like um you know Shah Rukh khan was a staple right he's a staple like no matter what what your age is like the man is like he's an icon and i feel like so many people's childhoods or even teenage like he's just always been there and i obviously loved him but the minute that man walked in, I kid you not, like everyone fell silent because he holds a crazy amount of charisma. And that's like, if, if, if charisma had a human uh, face, it would genuinely be Shah Rukh Khan in person. And I'm not saying, I know you're laughing, but I swear it was like, 
Okay, Wael Halak comes close, but Shah Rukh Khan takes the cake, okay? Like, Shah Khan, like, I was like, what is that? First of all, uh, I, wait, I have to pause and appreciate how probably no one has ever used uh, Wael Halak and, and Shah Rukh Khan in the same sentence. So um, you take that the cake. Up uh, by, that sums up uh, yeah, my... There you go. And, and there you go. Way, by the way, listeners, you may not know this. It may not have come up in the previous 107 episodes, but Bar- Barbez knows a little something about uh, uh, Bollywood as well. I mean, uh, yes. I'm oh. pretty sure uh, he can quote every Amitabh movie from oh between my the NFL 70s. I'm, and- I'm, 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 yeah, I'm a little older vintage. And then I also spent two and a half years living in Bombay, which um, so like I went to like I, I went to middle school with like Nasiruddin Shah's daughter and Nasiruddin Wait, Shah like, ta- taught us drama and speech and debate. Stop. Yeah. I Wait, could you did not interview no. you? Wait, wait, I'm about, I want to interview Parvez <laughs> right now. Forget me. What? By the way, by the way, you mentioned Amitabh. I just want to say, like, every at one point in our lives, every year, and now it's like every few years, my father makes us watch. I think you know what movie I'm gonna say, Baf Bon. Do you know that movie? We're about oh like God, the mom and yeah. dad. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about? The mom and dad and how like their their kids separate them because none of them care for them, but it's their adopted son who like cares for them. My dad's like, watch this movie. Who happens you to be Salman care. Khan, of course. Who, yeah. who of course is yeah. Salman Khan, right? And I'm just like, yeah. my father would make us watch that every year. He's like, always appreciate your parents. I'm like, we're not, first of all, it's just me and my brother. Secondly, we're not going to separate you. Like, what is this? <laughs> yeah, but, right, but, right. But back to the, the Shah Rukh Khan story. Sure, so, sure. you know, so a little context. I used to troll Sharon on Twitter. Like, I was be really like, hey, SRK, what's up? Like, how you doing? Like, just like, you know, whatever. And he never responded to me. Like, and it was fine. And um, and as he walks over to us, he looks at me, touches my arm and says, how have you been? I was like, ah, well. Like, what did this man just do? He And, you know, and my two colleagues were like, oh, my God, he recognized you. I was like, oh, my God, he recognized me. To be fair, I share a name, like my name, Sana Saeed. I share it with the actress who played Anjali in Kuch Kuch Hotai, whose name is also Sana Saeed. So I'm like, he can't forget me. Like, come on. I'm forever in your psyche, Shah Like, yes. So he comes and we start talking and whatever. And, um, you know, uh, I, we have our little pleasantries, like, it's so good to see you finally, da, da, da. And he's looking at me and I say, hey, Shah Rukh, do you mind, um, like, when I'll ask you the question, you can look at me, but like, can you look at the camera when you're asking, when you're answering the question? And he says, sure. He's like, but can I look at you when you're, when you're asking the question? Like, he kind of repeated that. And I said, oh, I would love that. And he blushed. He blushed. I was like, <laughs> that's right. And it's on camera. And I was like, that's right. I made Shah Rukh Khan blush. Anyways, he was a sweetheart. We got a selfie with him. No one else got a selfie with him. We got a selfie with him. Um, and uh, it was great. It was really genuinely great. And he's he's also like, by the way, for someone of his stature, he is incredibly humble. Like, incredibly humble. Also, uh, FYI, for anyone who might actually care about this, he looks way better in person than on camera. I'll just put it, I'll just put it out there. That is, That man looks amazing in person. Wow. Okay. Um, <laughs> you, got a lot of, you, got, you got a Halak story and a Shah Rukh Khan story for me. I know. Yes. That is amazing. That, thank you for the that's, scoop. Uh, that's my duality. I just want to point that is my duality. Halak well, and uh, Shah Rukh Khan. <laughs> so so speaking mean, of duality, this is actually speaking of duality, right? As I was looking, I was hearing what you're saying. Obviously, you had a lot of influences. Even in your bio, you say a Canadian who spent most of her life in the U.S. You don't. You actually refer to yourself as a Canadian, and you lived in New York. So, as somebody myself who's married to a Canadian, but being an American, um, want to know what what out of those questions is the thing that informs your your identity the most? You know, is is it all three, and and, and including the desi the desi background? And the reason I ask that is because um, being married to a Canadian, I see that the Canadian influence and the U.S. influence is very and and and, and how how a lot of us grew up in each of those countries is very different. Right. Um, just people I can speak to, to, yeah, people tend to use them interchangeably, right? Almost as if there are no differences between, you know, being Canadian and being American. Is that your? Is that what you're saying, Omar? Um, I'm not, not. What I'm saying is, I'm curious where what has influenced Sana in terms of right. um, the most. How did you know she describes herself as a Canadian? But um, just curious, like what's informed her identity the most, uh, and because that will play into her career as a journalist as well, which we're so, going to get to. That's a really good question because it's something I, I think because I've had all these. So 
I've, you know, I have a, I was born in Pakistan. And as I mentioned, I grew up in the U S and in, um, and in Canada. And I think because, and, but even then when I was living in all these places, like moved around a lot, um, San Francisco was actually the first time in a very long time that I had lived somewhere without actually like moving apartments. Like it was an apartment I had by myself and I lived there for four or five years, however long I was there, um, straight and didn't move in, which was, which was, I was like, wow, it's the first time I've done this. Um, and I would say that in a way, like obviously moving around so much and, and existing in all these different, uh, countries, um, and also just w- whether it's going back and where I'm existing in those countries, because DMV is very different from the Bay Area, very different from New York. Montreal is very different from Vancouver, which is very different from like the boondocks of northern Alberta, where my family now lives. So um, like I, I do obviously all these things have had an influence on me. But when I think about like if you were to say like like I say I'm a Canadian because that's what my passport is. Right. Like. And also because I do have, you know, there are a lot of things like there, I, I do know there are certain things that are very influential on me that are very Canadian as well. Right. Um, uh, like, for instance, uh, for straight up, like I don't know and I generally don't know if I had grown up in the United States, would I be a supporter of universal health care? Just as an example. Right. Like, I don't know. I And I, I would hope I would be because to me, that is the moral and correct position. But I don't know. But I do know because I grew up in Canada and I was exposed to the benefits of um, uh, of a universal health care and as, as 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 many problems as we have with that system and of course you know when I say universal it doesn't include a lot of things like we don't have dental right like dental is not under universal health care so it's very very particular but even then like because I grew up experiencing and witnessing and benefiting from that particular uh, perspective and 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 policy, I support it now. And it very much so informs like, and because of that, it's also informed, you know, like my other belief and other things that are universal, because I see the benefit of it. So, you know, there's certain things like, yeah, my Canadian identity plays into it. Um, I don't know where my American identity, to be honest, like begins and ends. Like, I don't know if I have a super American identity. I will say when I'm in Canada, I like when I moved there, when, when you know, I was like, 12 years old, I felt very American. And I was very resistant to embracing Canada, which only took like a year. And then I was very Canadian, but like, um, you know, I was very resistant to it. I had a very strong New York identity. I was like, you can't strip this away from me. Um, and, but today, if you were to ask me which identities of mine are probably the most at like the forefront and really inform my, um, my journalism and everything, like, to be honest, like it's probably my Muslim identity more than anything. It's like, I don't, I don't feel like I belong per se in any of these countries. And I don't mean that in like a womp womp. That's so sad. Like, I don't consider it like, you know, like I'm like, I just live here and it's cool. And like, I care about the people here and the society in which we live in and whatever it is like, but I would say in terms of what informs me and is, and it's, and I think that's grown as I've learned more and engaged with the question of like Islam more, um, has really been my Muslim identity. Right. I think a lot about like, as a Muslim, when I'm covering certain issues, you know, I think about the morality of that. And of course that makes is I'm extremely like left, right. Like I have very, very, I mean, five years ago, I didn't you know, ident- I'm like, I don't identify anywhere on the spectrum, but as I've grown, as I've read, as I've understood things, I'm like, I'm actually extremely, far left. And, uh, and actually that, that doesn't necessarily mean what people always think, think that it means, right? Like, I think my politics are actually a lot more confusing than they, than, than people would expect them to be. But, but I would say like, but even like my leftism is very much so rooted in my Islam. Like, as I learn more about Islamic history, about Islamic law, as I learn more about like all these things, um, you know, uh, I, I learned more about the Prophet Sallallahu and like, you know, I read more from the Sira, like all these things pushed me further in a certain way, uh, which impact the work that I do as well. Right. If I support, for instance, BDS, I support BDS because of what I believe is like, also because of what I believe is a demand of me, uh, like rooted in my faith, which is a demand of justice. Right. Like, so I would say the most influential in my identities of the various identities that I have, it's absolutely going to be like the way that I have grown into and understand my Islam. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah I, I, mean, I can definitely relate to that. I can definitely relate to that. And and you don't see, um, well, I was going to say, obviously coming from being in New York and San Francisco, uh, not exactly like your, your most red, red States heartland of America. Right. Uh, 
but you don't see any conflict or clash between that super progressive uh, point viewpoint and your Islamic identity, uh, right? Well, it depends, right? Because I don't identify, I like progressive for me has a very different connotation, I guess, because I am so far left. And so progressive for me, I'm like, yeah, it's not too far left enough. But like, um, you know, I know they're not like I've addressed this a little bit and I haven't really gone into it. I do think there are certain things that I'm still working through in terms of like certain things that are our progressive politics, which I do think um, do end up clashing with certain like absolutely Islamic law. Right. And, um, but I'm also one of those people who's like, okay, so Islam is what it is. And then progressive politics or leftist politics are what they are. And I'm just trying to figure out like myself in between these two as well. Right. Um, and that being said, like, yeah, so, and I think that's hard. I think it's really hard. Like, I'm not going to sit here and try to justify certain things that are progressive or leftist, which are antithetical to Islam and which, which I may or may not support, like, you know, um, like I said, my, I think my, my, even my leftist perspectives can probably confuse some people. Um, but, um, but I'm not going to sit here and justify those as like, no, Islam says this is okay. Or Islam says that I'm like, no, that like, we know what the traditional, what the vast majority of the five Islamic schools of thought actually say about these particular issues. And I'm not going to change that because of a political, political, like, or sorry, of a, because of a particular political, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, move or whatever. So, um, yeah. No, I, I think, you know, what, what I appreciate, you know, Sana, it's just you, like your candor, I mean, just th throughout the whole conversation, but especially, you know, as it relates to this issue, because, you know, I, I think it's only human to recognize that we are an amalgamation of different identities, different, different things that have an influence on us, um, whether it's our ethnic background, whether it's our, you know, how we were brought up and raised, you know, and just for the record, you know, like you, so you like you're on the show with two people who also grew up in many, like who spent time, you know, moving from place to place, having to adapt, having to, you know, kind of, you know, negotiate a new identity or a new cultural perspective, um, you know, and, um, and so, it, you know, and, and so not only are we an amalgamation of those various things, at times those things may or can be contradictory, and and it's up, and then we kind of wait, work we, we work out our own way of how we negotiate that. So, for example, like you said, politically, you know, you may be on the far left in terms of political spectrum, and, and then how do you negotiate that with your Islamic identity or what Islam says on categorically, perhaps. Argue, you know, are arguably mm -hmm. categorically on these X, Y, Z issues. So, I think to me that's just all really, really fascinating. And as a journalist, I mean, I'm also curious. Like, I like growing up, or when people ask me, like, "Hey, where are you from?" Like, I always have to kind of like, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a, I'm kind of the military brat minus the military because, in, in the way, I, the reason I say that is because. I have moved around so much, and I am kind of this mutt of like different, you know, backgrounds and so on. So, I mean, I, I, I think it's, I think we really need kind of a language to speak to that because I think so many of the things that you're mentioning, Sana, our listeners, you know, people who are listening to the show are tapping right into, and I don't think we have a vernacular to discuss that. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's, you know, I, I like how you said, yeah, like we're, we're mutts, right? I don't even, I don't even like the term like third culture kid. Right. I think, there I think you go. Mutt is better. And also like, we were just talking about geographic stuff, right? Like I haven't even got into like class, right? Like right. I've had, I've had right. so many different, you know, where I'm like, I, I didn't grow up. Like I, I didn't grow up thinking my parents would ever own a home, for example, or a house, right? Like that's not like, I grew up in a very financially struggling working class type of family. And that informed a lot of my, um, uh, politics as well as I've grown older, because I mean, funnily enough, like when I was a kid, I didn't have any kind of idea of class. I was like, this is just how we live. I, and I thought this is just how all Desi Muslims live. And as I got older, I was like, Oh, wait, no, 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 Sana. This is not necessarily how all Desi Muslims live in the United States or in Canada. Like sure. some people, you know, actually are extremely well off and so on and so forth. And then moving from that kind of class dynamic and moving into another one, because obviously like still as immigrants, there's their levels of privilege that we have that like, obviously others don't right? like who, like for instance, obviously uh, a lot of in the black American um, community don't. Right. So, so I was able to move from one class and when I get to San Francisco, I mean, it was funny because I wasn't making that much money in San Francisco. Right. I, but I was a professional there. Right. So I was in the professional class, so to speak in San Francisco, 
quote unquote, yeah, like the professional class, but I was not making, I was not able to live up to that lifestyle because I didn't have the money for it. I was using two paychecks to pay rent for my 355 square foot apartment, right? And I remember someone recently, I won't take his name, but like about last year, someone was like, well, you were in San Francisco making like, making so much cash. I'm like, first of all, I was a journalist. Like, I don't think you understand journalists don't get paid that much. Secondly, no, like it was, right. it was really miserable. Like I was struggling to buy groceries and stuff, but you don't talk about that stuff. Like, cause no one, no one wants to be like, oh, FYI, I'm, I'm struggling with buy groceries or whatever. I have to like, whatever, right? But also because of that experience where I was with a very particular social cl- with a very pr- uh, particular social class, while I was struggling to make these ends meet, like really opened up my eyes to another dynamic of class as well. And that informed, you know, um, uh, my politics and my direction as well. And now that I'm in the DMV where I can't afford an apartment, you know, um, it's, uh, it's a whole other, uh, uh, you know, awakening as well. So it's like, there's so many things that impact who we are and like, and and it's okay. It's absolutely okay. Like that this is happening because it's natural, right? Like even when we talk about like traditional scholars of yesteryears or whatever, I'm like, do you think literally one thing was impacting them their entire lives? Right. Like that they only had one identity and that was as a Muslim, like, you know, I'm like, especially when we know that people would include sometimes the name of their cities uh, in their names as well. Right. The way they identify, like identifiers matter. Right. And I, and, and, and I have a whole thing also about the way we engage in identity politics, which is a whole other conversation. Wow. Um, but identity does absolutely matter because it does inform who, like the way you consume everything, the way you understand certain things. There's a reason why you don't like this versus that and so on and so forth. And for me, I think what I've also tried very hard is not to be beholden to my identities, right? And not to negate their importance, but also be able to understand things that are happening and what I believe outside of those identities, right? Um, I'm like, do I only believe this because I am like, from this particular ethnicity? Do I believe this only because of this or whatever? Like, why do I believe this? And I, and so for me, like, again, identities are important, are extremely important. And we shouldn't just like, I think sometimes we, we, especially in our community, we we're like, I'm Muslim and that's it. That is my primary identity. I do not exist in like borders do not exist for me. I'm like, look, I agree. Borders are BS and everything, but, but it absolutely matters because like, you know, we live in the real world. We live in the real world. And also like when you are, you know, this is, this is part of our faith too, right? It's like when you are among a people, you become of them. That's and right. right. Like within 40 days, I believe it's like the, if I'm, I don't want to misquote, but like, I think the Hadith is basically if you're among people for like 40 days, you become of them. And there's actually really, because it also takes, you know, 40 days to, to, uh, to develop a habit. Right. So it actually makes sense scientifically. And it's like, yeah, because you're spending time with people and you become of the people you are a part of. And that influences what you do, what you believe in and so on and so forth. Like, so borders, sure. We can like, I agree. Like I don't believe in borders. However, as they exist and as we interact with the world and one another, they absolutely impact what we believe. And it's not just Islam, which is like impacting what you believe. So do you think, do you think more, uh, more people are where what you're describing, which I, like I said, I totally relate to that uh, as Barbez alluded to, you know, we're, we're, we're all mutts. Um, But presumably when you're interacting as a journalist, you're getting, conservative, super conservative Muslim voice you may be hearing saying being progressive is bad. You may be hearing um, the the far, you know, the, 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 the left voices that say religion's bad um, and so on and so forth. I could give you, I could give you a, a bunch of examples. Are you, are you seeing more of that or are you seeing more of what you're describing or is it just that the former is our amplified voices? Tell us a little about kind of the pushback on what you're saying. I mean, I definitely see a lot of the former a lot. Like there's definitely like uh, those voices are definitely very, very amplified. The extremely, the problem is, is that we've only presented two um, options 
to our community in our quote unquote public discourse in the American Muslim community that you are either, by the way, I'll say this, like even like, like just, just for terminology, like I don't consider most people who would be a pro- quote unquote progressive in the large Muslim community to be far left. I think a lot of their politics are actually very liberal and like just very, um, you know, they're, they're, they're not actually for things that would be considered leftist values like economic justice and, 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 and whatnot. Um, and, and actually, but that's a whole other conversation, but you know, so, th- but there is, yeah, and you have this like really extreme like conservative bent which is very much so mimics this alt like you know the term alt ah right like that the, kind of a perspective the ah, oh, the ah, the ah, right. The ah yeah, right yeah right yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the ah right my bad no no, the no, alt no ah. we talked we talked about <laughs> yeah i love the alt ah yeah yeah the alt ah why not right that's that's a whole new movement no no so yeah right the, <laughs> the, the ah the off right and then like you know the super progressive which is like islam is what you make it that's how i would like you know, I feel like we have these two strains, which is like yeah. Islam is just between you and God and nothing else matters. And I'm like, well, yeah, OK, like, obviously, at the end of the day, like, it, uh, like your deen is between you and Allah. But like also like rules matter. Like we live, exist in a community. If you're not in, like this. And that to me is actually that's what I mean by liberal, like because it's very individualistic and it takes the community completely out of it. Then on the other hand, you have people who are like shaking their fist at modernity and actually are the beautiful products of modernity itself. I'm like, you do not realize that you are actually mimicking the rhetoric of modernity while you are critiquing it. And I have a feeling that if I were to ask you, please define modernity in one sentence, you could not do it. Right. So like we, these are the two options we've given our community. And so the discourse in our, in our community is split between these two groups, right? It's all online, but the vast majority of people I think are sick of that. They want something else, right? They want something that's actually realistic because when you present extremes, which is like, and and extremes of what Islam is in particular, Islam is either something that is this amorphous blob and and you make it what you want and everything is okay. And uh, to a point where I'm like, so it's not really a religion. It's just what you make of it. Okay. Or it becomes something so rigid and and in both cases, it's not an Islam people recognize and it's trying to create an Islam that doesn't resemble Islam anymore. I actually have a draft that I wrote on this that I have not published yet because I'm so afraid of like, not afraid of the backlash, but the political moment kind of overtakes everything. Right. But, um, but, but I have something on, but like we've created these two versions of Islam that do not resemble Islam. And when people see that, what worries me is that it just leaves them saying, so where do I fit? I, so I want to pause because I think, like I said, there's a lot to unpack in what you're saying, and I don't want to leave anything on the table uh, not unpacked properly, uh, although that's probably bound to happen just given, I think, that the number of issues that you've raised, which is wonderful, but I just want to be careful to, like I said, try to spend time and shed light and unpack some of the things that you are bringing up. So I think you, two things that you, I'd love to kind of go back to. One, you talked about the kind of two extremes that we see uh, in the Muslim community, as far as our public discourse is concerned, I'd, I'd love to kind of um, like talk about that. Let's name that, you know, let's sit with that for a bit. And then this idea of like these two Islams that are, that, that don't exist and yet we've shaped. So let's go back to the, to the, to the former and, 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 and let's kind of, like I said, sit with that for a moment. So when we look at how Muslim, uh, how the Muslim community uh, is engaged in these public discourses. Do you think that these, let's say, or would you agree that the two amplified voices that we hear are the ah right on the one hand, and on the other hand, the kind of talking head pundit establishment class of liberals? Yes, I would say it's. Um, so I would say yeah. On the, on the one hand, you have the the off right absolutely and on the other hand i think it's a mixture i think you have the exact the establishment liberal class the political i'll just call them muslim political class right like that's the name or they so just just interjecting here real quick um you mentioned and both of you mentioned the term off right um or alt off right obviously i know what alt right is um but maybe for the sake of our listeners, and even for myself, you could define what that means exactly. Um, and and the flip, what what's the opposite extreme of that? How would you define those two those two extremes? So I guess the off right would be basically this group of um, Muslim public uh, connoisseurs um, who uh, use Islam, Islamic language references to Islam 
but actually mimic a lot of the same kind of uh, rhetoric that you find on the alt-right regarding uh, women regarding uh, public Muslim figures as well, and regarding just general politics. Um, so whether it's issues of like the way they talk about what are the rights of women in Islam and, you know, or like, ah, the curse of feminism and whatnot. Um, or they're talking about Muslim women like Ilhan Omar, Representative Ilhan Omar, or um, uh, in particular, because she's, you know, the, uh, the off-right love coming after her in particular. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, it, so that's that group. And it's, it's, it's people who have created, and, and of course they rail against Western society and liberalism and everything without realizing that they are absolutely mimicking the very thing that they are critiquing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I was smiling when you were discussing <laughs> it because, no, because like I, I someone, and I, uh, who I won't mention, but he referred to, uh, you know, the, the, this sort of group, this amorphous sort of off right movement as like cantankerous uh, men. Um, and I think that's like in, in many ways that like beautifully captures, I think so yes. much of that movement. Right. Right. So that's perfect. No, that's uh, absolutely perfect. Yeah. Okay. So, and then to Omar's point, like, what is the, what is the opposite of that? If there is like, I, I know again, to my question that I asked earlier, which was like, if, if, if that's on the one hand and on the other hand, the people who have, who get the vo their voices amplified being this, um, I, and I think you, like you mentioned something like whether it was the establishment or the liberal, like, yeah, the establishment or political class. Yeah. I mean, I, I think on the opposite end, you have a much more like a liberal political class. Um, and, and that includes, I think people who are also uh, media makers, so to speak. Um, and it is uh, oftentimes where Islam itself becomes um, a professional identity um, and something that you kind of deal in versus maybe always like um, a religious identity, right? Um, and I think that this group is a lot bigger um, in terms of um, the off right. I think the off right. So I think the off right has figures who are like the 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 the, the public figures in the off right are far and few in between. I would say, Correct. but they are loud. They are very loud and they have a huge audience. So I will say that on the opposite end of the spectrum, you have this kind of political class of Muslims who are huge in numbers, but I don't think they have necessarily as big of an audience as they would like us to believe. And I'm basing that off of my own personal experiences. Now, I think that, but because the political class upholds itself, they are always in the public and it seems as though they have much more support than they may actually have. And by so the way, you, specify, the political class does not include like elected officials like, you know, Representative no. Rashida Taleb and Ilhan Omar. That's a, that, I'm not talking about that kind of a political class. And, and just trying to understand this a bit more. So, I, you know, I, I uh, part of my part of my background is having lived in a very small, uh, small, very, very conservative place. And are you saying that um, the arc right will use some of the talking points that I, I would hear from some of my like uh, friends from from youth about, um, you know, Hey, uh, fathers of African American parents need to step up, or uh, we're our, you know Christian 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 believers' rights are being taken away. Is that is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, it's those yeah, talking it's like, points are yeah, being those, in it? Yeah, exactly. Something like that, and then of course, like it's also quote unquote like the incel language, right? Incel, which is the involuntarily uh, celibate. Which I'm like, oh, isn't that like a lot of Muslims? But like, but in terms of very political, political, a very particular political movement online, which is like the reason why we're celibate is because women just won't like sleep with us, right? And so, and they oftentimes speak about women in such a tone and language which you see replicated amongst the supporters of the off right as well. Right. Which is like, women are the problem. Mm -hmm. The reason I'm not married is because women are too independent. Now women have jobs and therefore they think that because they have some money that, they, you know, so there's like, there's that, there's like a lot happening on the off right. Like there's a lot and it's I'm like, this really resembles, like it blows my mind that you don't see how you are just a Muslim Jordan Peterson. Right. Or a Ben Shapiro or something of that sort. Like, that's all you are, you know, and th these same people, which is ironic to me because, this, you know, they're mimicking the talking points and the language and the tactics of also people who are Islamophobic. Right. Right. Like, right. Like Jordan Ben Peterson, Shapiro. Yeah. Jordan Peterson, by the way, who was invited to reviving the Islamic spirit. 
which it blew my mind that he was invited to that. And then they had to like, un like disinvite him, take away, like rescind the invitation because people are like, yo, like, first of all, he's majorly Islamophobic. Like, listen to what he said about Muslims. Secondly, what? Like this dude's a misogynist, right? Like, um, I think, I think well, a having, lot of people, I was just going to say, you know, like we, we kind of know now it's become, uh, it's, it's, it's a much broader, um, statement or, or th thing understood thing now that, you know, you have a certain segment of the population, um, you basically scapegoating like your, 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 your people of color, right. And saying drop, but, but you bring up a good point that we don't talk about as much, which is also, also using that same approach against women as well right so I, that's a whole nother topic the whole, the whole incel thing i mean i know we were we were talking about n names and stuff but like I, I, you know a perfect example to me in terms of like how we also end up ignoring women in our own community is like daniel hakikaju someone who um ironically uh, ironically years years ago i actually really appreciated a lot of like what he would say we were on a similar listserv and um you know for years since tw 2014 is when i was kind of you know it's funny someone a friend of mine heard me uh critiquing uh, like he heard that I was kind of critical of capital F feminism and, uh, and he's like, Oh, well, since you're critical of feminism, I think you'll enjoy what this man has to say about women. And I was like, what? And I listened to it and I was like, sir, just because I'm critical of feminism does not mean I'm a misogynist. Like, I don't know why, like that you thought that was okay. And I was really surprised because I knew Daniel from this listserv and I was like, what is, what is happening here? And women started talking about this back in 2014. We were saying like, yo, the stuff this man is saying is really, really problematic. Like it's really, and it's, it's the kind of stuff that has material harm on women. It's not just like, oh, he said something and I don't like it, which is another thing that I think is really important when we talk about issues of quote unquote deep platforming or cancel culture, which is like, we have to make a, a difference. We have to make this demarcation. We have to between, did I not like what that person said or did what that person say? Does it have material harm on us? And what is that measure? How are we measuring it? And, and can we actually point it out? And Hakika Ju absolutely, like the rhetoric that he's employing had and does have material harm on the safety and well-being of women. It has harm on our 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 our, our access to uh, uh, spaces as well and and whatnot. And people don't realize like it's just one man saying something. I'm like, no, it's one man saying something with a massive platform that has an influence in the way people think, right? And so we were saying this ages ago, and it's only when. Hakika Jew started coming after everyone's favorite imams, also my favorite imams, don't get me wrong, and favorite institutes and whatnot, because he had been personally wronged, that all of a sudden, a lot of men in our community with public platforms started saying, you know what, Hakika Jew is a problem. Yeah, he's a problem. And I'm like, wait a second. What about all these women who were saying for years, like, watch out for this guy? And this is a problem that it's not specific to the Muslim community. This is a problem. Like when someone the other day was like, you know, people use the word misogyny, but they never define it. I'm like, this is what it is. When we talk about misogyny, it's the fact that in every community, no matter what community is, the majority, the majority community, whatever, when women raise the red flags, when we raise the alarms, we sound the alarms, no one listens. And it's only when the house is on fire that everyone's like, all right, everybody get out now. Right. Like that. And I'm like, so, so like, just on that front, right? Like this is something women in our community, women outside of our community have been talking about for a very, very long time that listen, something ugly is coming and we need to really, really be smart about this. Because another thing people forget is that uh, as women, and I, I don't want to like generalize and essentialize, but I'm just going to say, say this is like as women, oftentimes, because we are, despite being, you know, the majority, right, in terms of sheer numbers, women are the majority, despite that, um, we are treated as minorities, right? And because of that, and because of the fact that we at a very young age are taught how to, we have to learn, sorry, how to survive in this world, right? How to protect ourselves, whether it's walking down the street, whether it's being uh, in a room alone with a man or anything. We actually, unfortunately, have to learn these things either through other women or through um, experience, how to protect ourselves. We learn about red flags. We learn, we learn how to spot uh, patterns of behavior. So we see things coming. I, that's the thing. A lot of women oftentimes we see it coming, which is why I'm like, listen to women, like women know, um, you know, oftentimes what's on the horizon. Like these are lived experiences as opposed to just sort of hypotheticals that, yeah. you know, I, like I didn't, I didn't read this in a book, right? Like, you know, I didn't read this in a book and I'm like, Hey, listen, FYI. I'm like, no, it's oftentimes because 
we have seen in our personal lives the way that maybe certain misogynistic ideas, right, mm -hmm. and, and rhetoric then lead to certain misogynistic practices, mm. right? Like we see that on the, on the micro level and then we see it. And so when we see it at the macro, we can recognize we're like, that's what's coming. And the thing is, it's like these individuals, like I have seen the impact this has had, like, for instance, on my friends and mine, even like when we are like searching for a spouse or, you know, for a partner, right? It has an impact because of then how, like I have spoken to men and then they start repeating the same talking points. And I'm like, yeah, dude, I saw that same lecture. <laughs> like yeah, I know right. exactly what you're talking about. Like, don't, don't bring that here. So, because I think you're, it's very interesting. I mean, like you talk about Jordan Peterson, Ben Shapiro in particular, like, I, you know, uh, and I think it's broader than that. And perhaps this is where I've, no, but, but, but this is probably where I'm using the term ah, right to kind of include not only the kind of people that you're talking about, which is, you know, their main issues and their main crosses to bear have to do with LGBTQ issues or mm -hmm. feminism, capital F, but also like, you know, um, questioning the institution, you know, qu qu questioning institutionalized racism or questioning, oh, yeah. you know, the, 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 and, 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 and again, adopting the language of, um, the way we characterize the protests that took place during the summer, mm -hmm. uh, versus, and then, like I said, it's, it's, it's all like this amorphous pro Trump. Um, uh, but at this, and then, pro anti UAE. <laughs> sorry. Oh, pro, pro UAE, UAE. Thank you. Pro UAE. Um, anti-vaxxer even like it's all yeah. this like really ugly like cocktail of yeah, it's yeah, just yeah. right so do, would you agree that that's kind of the yeah, yeah. yeah i mean in a way i would say so then yeah it's a much bigger tent and it's like more than then the all like the off right it's like it's it's this it's this yeah i mean I, I guess that is the best term for it really because it's so reactionary yes and so and but the thing is but then it goes it's not, mar agree. it's not marginal, right? Because if we're, we're talking about that, it's not a marginal issue. In it isn't. Fact, it isn't. It's major institutions, right? There's, there, like when we talk about questioning institutional racism, one of my earliest experiences of that in the United States in terms of like was at Zaytuna, right? Where I was sitting there and I, here we were like, and, and I'm, I'm going to drop the names. But I'm, but again, I'm not shy about it. But like Sheikh Hamza Yusuf goes up at a Malcolm X event and says, what is white privilege? Do I have it? I'm Irish. Uh, my ancestors, you know, I, we had Irish slaves and I sat there completely like shocked. This was in 2014 or, or 2015, February, 2015 on the birthday, I believe of, of Malcolm X. And I was shocked. I, I, I was there, Sana. And I think you, you, you did, you did in the Q and a session. That's a different, that's a different, oh, sorry. Uh, that was the, that was the one with uh, uh, Chris Hedges, which I wrote about. I wrote yeah. about that. So, so what, what happened since you're referring to it, I, I wasn't there. What, what, what happened here? So the Chris Hedges event, I mean, this one, honestly, I almost feel like, sorry, real quick. I almost feel like I just want to put in a disclaimer here. I mean, like, like again, like we, we all, I think all three of us, you know, we have esteem and regard for all of our scholars, um, you know, including even Sheikh Hamza, although we may disagree with him on particular issues. I just want to point that out. Like, I don't want to kind of cleanse. It's not by any means a way to exp expiate for what we're saying or cleanse the conversation, because I think it's really important to hold our leadership to task. Um, I just want to, I just want to say that to our oh, yeah. learners. Like, I yeah, I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll say it up front. I mean, my, my, my favorite scholar, uh, who I, you know, who is, is Sheikh Hamza, to be perfectly honest, uh, the one who's had the most impact on me doesn't mean, you know, he, I, 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 that we particularly I from him, right? right? I mean, I still love him, right? But uh, it's an interesting conversation. Right. Um, you know? And for me, I, I guess I can yeah. say, like, um, I appreciate a lot of what Hamza Yusuf has done in terms of some of his scholarship and what uh, he, especially many, few years ago, like, just, you know, has contributed a lot to the conversation. Um, like I, I'm trying to remember the exact name of the paper. I remember reading it like ages ago, but it was something on pornography. Right. And I really appreciated that. And I love like, you know, his lectures on, on uh, the Prophet Sallam and the Sahaba and stuff like that. So I appreciate a lot of work that he's put out. Absolutely. And so when I say this, like for me, it, it comes down to accountability and also quite like when I talk about these issues, it's not like uh, I'm out here to take people down. Like that's not my interest. And I think sometimes my work 
Um, and what I talk about gets characterized that way as well, like by people who don't necessarily see the big picture of what, like when you start seeing, I think what I'm doing and what I'm talking about, it's not about taking people down. It's, and it's not even just about accountability, right? Accountability absolutely is paramount, but it's also about us asking ourselves, what is it that we're building, right? We talk about, we're building uh, uh, institutions in this country and leadership in this country. Well, what are we building and who are we building as well? And I want us all to be able to question that and be critically engaged with that. Um, and so that's why, like, when I talk about people and I name people, it's not like, I want to take you down. Ugh. It's really to be like questioning, like, you know, what is it that we've built and what is it? Healthy conversation. It's, it's, yeah, it's just healthy conversation. Right? Yeah, it's, it's just a normal, when you can't, it's a normal conversation. That's yeah. it. Um, yeah. But regarding like your yep. question, what happened was in 2014, it was my first day tuna event and uh, a friend had invited me and, you know, she was like, hey, Chris Hedges and Hamza Youssef, Sheikh Hamza Youssef are going to be speaking about um, basically the role of violence and like revolution. It was something like that, like, um, yeah. or the role of nonviolence. So I, I can't re remember right now off the top of my head, but um, I mean, the Facebook event still exists <laughs> all these years later. Um, and I was like, oh my gosh, Sheikh Hamza and Chris Hedges, like, hell yeah, I'm going to go. And so I went there and I'm like, oh my God, Zaytuna. Like I was also like super at that time getting into Zaytuna. I was like, this is so cool. Wow. Um, and I went to this event and, you know, Chris Hedges, I believe spoke first and I, I love Chris Hedges and I, and as a journalist, like I absolutely adore him and what he has to say. And so everything he was saying, I was just like taking notes and I was like, this is amazing. Wow. And then Sheikh Hamza started speaking and I was kind of surprised by a few things he was saying. And I was like, you know, uh, and it was regarding the role of violence in revolution. And, um, and, and kind of, he was talking, I mean, he was, he was, he was talking like uh, as a liberal, right? Like talking about incremental change is better than revolution and so on and so forth. And I was kind of taken aback and I was like, um, okay, that's really interesting. And so, um, you know, I was like, I'll just ask, ask a question. Like I just, you know, I, I'm not shy of asking questions and I'm going to ask a question in the Q and A. And I raised my hand and um, I think I was originally supposed to be actually the first or second person to go, but there was some sort of mix up and I ended up being unfortunately the last person to ask, I think, a question. Um, and the, yeah. And so the person who went before me, I think he kind of attacked Sheikh Hamza. So it immediately put Sheikh Hamza on like a defensive mode. And this is again, 2014. This is around the same time that Sheikh Hamza is also, you know, for context, he's getting like threats um from isis and stuff like that like it was a tumultuous period for him and for zaytuna just for more context and um you know so this man just kind of was was really uh, uh questioning some of the things that she comes said in, in a kind of an aggressive manner and she comes was on the defensive and i'm like oh okay those are you know those are that's gonna be tough 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 act to follow right and i start off like salam she comes yusuf um you know my name is sana and i have a question for you and what i and i said i'm just gonna challenge you a little bit and i didn't and i think he took that so i didn't get to ask my question and he said i'm gonna stop you right there like um all oh, right so i said sorry let me re uh, remember exactly what happened because i don't want to miss remember uh, how it happened. I said, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to challenge you a little bit on what you said regarding the role of violence in, um, in, uh, um, uh, in revolution. Right. I'm like, so as you know, like with the civil rights movement and then he stopped me, he's like, I'm going to stop you right there. And he just kind of went off on me. Right. And he said, um, he said a bunch of stuff and I was just so taken aback. Like, I'm like, what is happening? Like I kind of, you know, when your face goes red and you, you don't really kind of like you don't know what's happening. You can hear the person, but you don't actually take in what they're saying because you're like, you're just so shocked. Like, wait, what, what did I say something wrong? And then he's like, wait, sorry, you didn't ask your question, finish your question. And my question was basically like, you know, how can we support um, movements that employ violence um, if, if, you know, and uh, while also, you know, upholding uh, nonviolent resistance, right? And so in my head, I'm thinking of like Palestinian cause, right? Like where there is violence used. So how can we support the Palestinian cause um, where there is a use of violence as resistance um, while upholding, you know, tenets of nonviolent resistance? Right. And basically from that question, he went on to say something to the effect of how what I was saying was in the realm of ISIS, like that kind of thinking was ISIS thinking and it blew me away like big, on many different levels because I was you know here was someone I really respected and, and 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 for many different reasons at that point and here I was new to this institution and here I was asking a question for the first time 
And not only was I first interrupted already and never asked, like allowed to ask my question, then I was allowed to ask my question. And then I was accused in 2014, not in 20, like in 2017 or sorry, in 2021, like people might like laugh it off or something. In 2014, it was a very different, obviously, like this is like at the height of like people finding out what ISIS was, et cetera. And when he said that it, and everyone, I just remember eyes on me because people were like, who is this girl that she comes? I just said this to. Mm. And it was so uncomfortable. And I felt so shaken to my core. And because it also put my physical safety right at risk. Like when you say that, that has an impact. Like you are putting me like if there's anyone in this room who like works with the cops or anything of that sort, all of a sudden all like eyes are on me and it like and I'm a journalist. And so I was terrified. And I, I can't remember if I wrote about this, but after the fact. I was like, you know what? Um, I still was like, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt, even though he accused me of having a mindset like ISIS for asking that a really basic question. Um, so I approached him and I said, "Salamu alaikum," and he just walked past me. Like he looked at me and kept walking. And I understand the reverence that people hold for him. And I held it at one point as well. But it is very, very hard to continue holding that when you have been, and even then I was like, okay, I didn't tell that story, by the way. I didn't tell, I waited six or seven years to tell that story when I wrote about it. And there was a reason for that. And for me, I kind of kept it to myself and I was I, I, to myself. And also like, by the way, the funny part was, is that there were, it was live streamed. So I had people text me and say, Sana, was that you who asked that question that Hamza Yusuf just said like this too? And I was like, yeah, that was me. And I had two of his students reach out to me and said, no, no, no. Like he was right. You were wrong. Your question was wrong. Like immediately they course tried to course correct me. And that really took me aback. I was like, why are people coming at He's the one who accused me of this. Like, wait, why am I like this 26 year old girl, like being accused of like, you know, you just don't know how to ask. Someone literally wrote to me and said, and we actually talked about it recently. He actually apologized to me after I wrote my piece. Um, he's like, I didn't realize like what I sounded like. Um, but he actually told me, you didn't know how to ask uh, the question. Which I was like, wait, what? Wait, you think so, somebody else said this to you? Or, yeah, someone or, else. Okay. Yeah, was, a former student of his, or like you right. know, someone who holds him in great reverence, said to Got me, it. like, you don't know how to ask a question. And I was like, what is happening here? And to me, that was a major moment in really starting to ask questions about what, like, how can someone get away with that? And how can like someone, how can people come to me and blame me? for not knowing how to ask a question when all I'm doing, like when he's the one who holds power and, and so on and so forth. But that really also made me start seeing, I mean, and then after that, I think like, as like I started, then I went to that Malcolm X event in, in 2015 where he said that about white privilege. And I was like, wait, what? I'm like, why is this? I'm like, cause I was still willing to give him a chance after he said that. And, but he said that, and I'm like, that's a bit weird, isn't it? Like, why would you say something like that in like 2015? Like, it's a little bizarre. And then I just saw it again and again and again. And I started, I distanced myself from Zaytun. I really did that. Um, and it became very hard for me to go to that institution. And then of course, just seeing the things that Sheikh Hamza was starting to say in his lectures and his, uh, his relationship with the UAE and the involvement with CVE and all these things. And of course, his entire trajectory under the Trump administration, you know, for me, like, that's where I'm coming from. Again, it's not like I want to take down Sheikh Hamza, which I'm like, even if I wanted to, I couldn't, right? Like, please, the man is probably the most popular Muslim in this country, like that ain't going to happen. But my interest isn't in that my interest is in asking that question, how are we building leadership and, and, and Islamic scholarship in this country? And what is it that we're allowing them to do at the expense of the safety of our community here and abroad? Yeah. And, and perhaps, you know, Sheikh, Sheikh Hamza is like maybe emblematic of that conversation that you want to have. And I think that to me, what is important is the conversation over the personality, although we can certainly talk about, you know, how, what Sheikh Hamza says or, or, or what, what, what the views that he holds are representative of it. I think the broader question that you raise is a really critical one for the for, for our for our community, and it kind of goes back to what we were talking about, which is these kind of amplified voices and how they come to represent what the Muslim like like what public discourse Muslims are having. So I, I'd love to kind of shift back to that, um, you know, and, and how. I think, like I said, it, it is kind of a broader conversation around the right, issue. You know, I think it matters that we also, in, instead of just like 
naming names and stuff. It's also about like, can we identify centers and institutions? And again, I'm not here saying let's take these institutions down. It's all about accountability and asking how we building these institutions. I think Zaytuna is a fantastic institution for what it can be. Right. But it's like, but we have to hold accountability. And so when I wrote that piece that I did about Shea Kamsa, which I got a lot of backlash for because people were like, oh, you're just cloud chasing. I'm like, first of all, that is a massive cloud chasing like Shea Kamsa. Um, also, that's not the clout you want because, you know, like in terms of people will just bash you. But, you know, people are like, why are you writing about it now? And I'm like, read the article. I'm not talking about like Shea Kamsa in and of himself. I'm talking about the way in which we continue to um, like this, this, this kind of psycho fancy that exists uh, amongst leaders. And it could be Muslim, le like Islamic leaders, or it could be non-Islamic leaders in our community that we think, I like, I'm like, look, I'm not above reproach. You want to write an article about how I'm problematic? Please do it. Tell me how I can better myself as a human being and what I'm giving into a community. Like do that, explain, like write that article and, 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 and make it constructive. I'm down here for it. I think I think a part of the problem also is is that unfortunately, like your intentions or the or the person writing the like the article or bringing up the issue, those intentions often get lost because we do live in this kind of very heightened, and for a lack of a better word, like you know woke or cancel culture, where the, the the people who are listening or consuming those pieces then kind of take it upon themselves to say, okay, now we need to just cancel Sheikh Hamza or cancel Zaytuna. Do you see what I'm saying? Like it's, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's, it's at the backdrop of this ugly, contentious oh, yeah. public discourse, a culture. It's all a snowball effect. Well, it's all a snowball we, effect in both yeah. extremes, right? We live in this culture of, 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 of this very ugly culture. And so, but, but at the same time, I don't think that that culture should inform or dictate, you know, you writing the piece that you want to write. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I don't let it. That's the thing, right? Which is why, like, even in that piece I wrote about Sheikh Hamza, and even like, I mean, I mean, I mean, Elfin kind of maybe in the room, right? But Pervez, you remember my piece possibly that I wrote about even like the Talif situation with you know with Osama Cannon. Like in both those pieces, right? Like, and I I kind of wanted people to read them also as ultimately unison because I think those pieces work really well together in unison. Is that I'm talking about what is the culture, and I explicitly state this in both those pieces is like we need to talk about this culture that we've fom we've we've fomented around islamic scholars and stas and sheikhs and all that like we need to talk about this because ultimately we are setting our, ourselves up in, in oftentimes for spiritual hurt. Mm -hmm. And I have seen that up front, like, you know, when the whole Talif thing, and I, I don't want to make that an issue here, obviously, because I know your own personal connections, but just to say like, when that story dropped, like, I kid you not, my heart shattered into pieces, into alt like pieces. I cried so much because it just, you know, like I, and I don't consider myself as someone who holds anyone up to a massive pedestal because I know better. Right. But still I was like, damn, I didn't hold someone up to a pedestal. And still, my heart is broken. Yeah. So broken. Right. Mm -hmm. Because I did, because, and I write in the piece why it was broken because of something that he was able to provide for me in a moment of like real, like despair in my own life. And it just shattered my heart. So like, I know firsthand how these things really can spiritually, even if for a moment, break us and for me ultimately it's like you know like like here's like 2001 dawa team but like you know my interest is like making sure that people in a way like aren't leaving the dean as well like in, in in heartbreak and hating it because it's so beautiful and it's so beneficial and i'm like i don't want people in our community to hate something so beautiful that's been gifted to us by way of birth or choice right sure so i i, I mean i and I agree with that, obviously, wholeheartedly. But to me, the elephant in the room still is the conversation around that particular individual. So, like, I, I'm I'm fine talking about the Talib situation and what you wrote about that, because as someone who attended, as someone who had, a, 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 you know, perhaps even looked up to, you know, Osama Cannon, like, how do you then negotiate? Like, how do you tell people who who hold these individuals in high regard? Mm -hmm. who fall from grace in our eyes, 
how do you view their legacy or their the the good work that they did? It goes back to I think a fundamental issue that people contest with whether it's Michael Jackson or it's you know what I mean like mm-hmm. it's like how do we like what is the legacy or how do we view the work that they do mm-hmm. apart from the so like in the case of like someone like Michael Jackson or the, or or an actor who or you know who falls from grace it's like can we separate the art from the artist? So in this case can we separate the good work that they've done from the individual? And, and I think you have to be super careful to distinguish between illegal, corrupt, more, Im, you know, immoral, corrupt right. activities and somebody sure. who, sure. hey, they have a different point of view. Oh, yeah. I, 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 different world well, view, right? Or they misspeak, right? Mm, no, no. no? I, I'd even take it a little further, Omar. I, I, I thought where you were going is I think we need to be careful where – you know, are accusations being made against individuals that are that that are of an ill or of a, like something of an activity that is illegal or an illegality versus a kind of moral, um, uh, you know, uh, imperfection or moral turpitude, right? I think there's no, yeah, well, there. maybe there's three buckets. Then there's three buckets, right? There's the illegal, right, which is hey, I'm not even going to deal with this person. Then there's the immoral, which is closer and unfortunately to that bucket okay but then there's oh i see what your you're friends saying. who you just like i have trump voter trump's diehard supporting friends from college and there's it's a different category than somebody who's committing a yeah. crime or even no. doing something more right right but like it's I very but at, that same, yeah. but at this i also want to visit your your previous question as well for i'll get back to that but just really quickly on that front like I used to be very much that way where I'm like, I had friends who were like, you know, had held views that I didn't agree with. But I think with time it, I was like, I don't know if I can be friends. Like, because a friend to me, isn't just someone who's like, Hey, we say hi once in a while. And it's like, what's up? Like for me, a friend is like, if I consider you a friend, it's someone that I've actually chosen to include in my life. And so for me, I'm like, I don't know if I can be friends with people who actively work or actually actively believe in the dehumanization of other human beings. Right. And ultimately support policies that do that. And that includes not just Trump supporters, but like, you know, even Zionists and so on and so forth. And that being said, if there is someone who is like actually open to conversation and understanding in a, in a way that is actually not like, Hey, we're here to debate, but actually, you know what, son, help me understand. Yes, I will be your friend. And I'm actually willing to do the work To like, um, even though it's not quote unquote my job to educate, but I'm like, I do actually believe that because of what I do and what I believe in, that it is my job to at least help educate those who I consider friends to be, to not dehumanize other human beings. Right. And I'm like, it's exhausting, but I'm willing to do that work. Right. But not like, you know, if you're not willing to have that conversation, I'm like, I I don't. And, and, and amazingly, I actually met some, a friend of mine who I've known for like 15 years now. And he's like, do you remember how much of a conservative I was when we used to talk back in the day? I'm like, yeah, you were like really conservative. You said some Islamophobic stuff, but I was 18. And I was like, I guess this is how people are. He's like, well, thanks to you. He's like all those conversations we had over the years. He's like, I am extremely left now. And I was like, what? I did that. And he's like, yeah, he's like, you really challenged me. And, And I remember our debates because we weren't like yelling at each other and so on. We were actually engaging with what is at the core of what you believe and why do you believe this? Have you ever thought about it this way? Right. So to that point, like it's, I have a very hard time being friends with, you know, people who think that like Palestinians don't like, like that, that Palestinians should be living separately in an apartheid. State. I'm like, yeah, I don't, I'm sorry. I, yeah, yeah, of course. Hard time. I think there's a spectrum, right? There's yeah. even each of those categories, especially the one where you disagree with them. Yeah. There's a spectrum in yeah. how, how um, open-minded, willing yeah. to grow. And, and also like, people. you know, when you were friends with your friends in college, you you don't necessarily think that one day they'll be supporting a, a fascist, right? Like that's not something you always think. Like your friends because of circumstances or whatever. Like my friends, like I had very different political views when I was in college versus now. Like I've people evolve over time as well. So sometimes, you know, it's circumstances, right? Um, pervades to your point, like what do you tell people who hold certain individuals in high regard? So I'm actually going to read, I pulled it out, like what I wrote, because I do think it was it was something that really helped me in the moment. And, um, and it was from someone who, like I said, I'd never met and he saw that I was hurting and he reached out and he said this to me and he said, ultimately the teaching is more noble than the teacher. So what you received is more noble than the conduit and you own what you received from him. And honestly, like he just kind of said that in a Facebook message and like in passing. And I was like, Holy crap. Like that's actually, 
that's so powerful because there are so many artists, there are so many cr creatives out there who absolutely, and I know it's hard to separate the art from the artist. Like I know that and I understand that completely, but sometimes there is art and there is scholarship that touches us and there's storytelling that touches us in such a way that it becomes a part of us. It becomes who we are on a day-to-day -day basis that influences who we want to become. And when the conduit is corrupted in some way, how do we do? And it's, I just loved how we said you own it at that point, the knowledge that you have received, you own that knowledge. It is you. And so like, you know, what I said in particular, um, uh, you know, to, to women, I said in this article that I wrote about the whole Talif situation, I said like to my sisters, hurt and confused, you own your faith, you own the good you've experienced and the knowledge you've gained. Our disappointments will never stop, but those disappointments cannot and should not define our Islam and our obedience to God, our love for the Prophet ﷺ, and our love for our vast community, flawed and human as it is, right? Yeah. And I think like that is the one thing that like I because of the position I occupy in this community and as a journalist, I'm privy to a lot of stuff that I don't share. Like, I, I, I just want to put like, people don't real. I also, I'm like, listen, if you've been talking about me behind my back, guess what? It ends up in my inbox folder. Like it always does. So, um, you know, cause people want to share with me cause they're like, Hey, this might interest you or this and that. And not in a gossipy way. We're really like, this is what we're going through. Some things are way too sensitive where I'm like, I actually responsibly cannot talk about this because yeah. this is there's layers to this and i don't think just like you just out people like in this way or whatever right um and it's, and it's a lot more and people's safety and all these things that you have to take into consideration as a journalist um but like you know so because of that i've had to learn how to separate like how to separate the art from the artist yeah. in our community as well so it's it's interesting you're talking about um the ability to critique. Um, and, and I want, I, it reminds me of my friend, my friend, my friends, I went to a Catholic school, uh, and the way they talk about their, their priest or their pastor, it's, it's on one hand, it's very much, Hey, I really, I love this person. And on the other hand, it's, yeah, I completely disagreed with what they said the other day and it's all good. Right. And maybe for whatever reason, we put our teachers and, and, and scholars and whatnot on, on this pedestal, um, and then it leads to these these situations where, you know, you have people in their own bubbles and, and you can't break those bubbles. Right. So, which it's, just, it's unhealthy. Right. Because you put people up and then the harder they fall or uh, it's just it creates division and, and bubbles within communities. Can you comment on that a little? And and, and uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's a really healthy approach to have, which is that I, I it's and I, the thing is, I also understand why in the Muslim community we have um, this type of an approach, which is like um, treating imams and scholars and and whatnot as near, like almost as um, what's the word as immaculate, right? I think like I, I understand uh, why there is this approach, unfortunately, and it's because we do not we don't have we don't have any kind of centering because our community has been broken up so much. I think this is part of the issue. It's not the only only part it's only part of it maybe a small part but i but i've been thinking about it a lot is that we've been so broken up for so long in various ways uh whether it's through like state policies in terms of just the way our communities have been treated and whatnot or just because of the Im immigrant experience for it because you know so many muslims are from immigrant communities as well um so various reasons and i think sometimes for for first gen or second generation people in particular you know there's a there's a stability in finding a figure who can actually provide you guidance in in a country in a society where you feel like there's so many different um ideas, temptations, um, pulls coming at you. Right. And so, um, I think that's part of the reason I think it's a very healthy relationship to have to, to not treat your, I think like anyone who's like anyone who's remained Catholic in the, in the last 20 years, it's been very hard for them. Like no doubt. Right. I, I would not, because we've seen how, like how, uh, the numbers show us, like how people who identify as Catholic has actually like, you know, um, uh, uh, decreased in the last few years. And especially those who attend church has decreased. And I've said this, like Muslims w absolutely r run the risk of running that if we don't actually, you know, like really properly hold to account certain uh, practices and, and, and the way that certain things are turning out in our community, unfortunately, right? Like there's already issues. And I think that like, um, you know, we, we, we will definitely possibly see that, that, that happen to us, even though we're not as obviously, an institutionalized community the way the Catholic community is. Um, but I do think it's important 
to absolutely like when I, that's the thing, like when I see a scholar, right. An Islamic scholar, like even if I'm good friends with them at this point, right. I, to me, they're human beings. They're people who are my friends who mashallah are incredibly knowledgeable about something. And that is the knowledge that they share just. And, and yes, the knowledge that they share though is, is sensitive because it is something that impacts the heart of the believer. It is something that impacts like our soul. And so it is very, they have a massive responsibility in a way that I, as a journalist, I may be an expert on certain things, um, but I'm not an expert on the heart in the way that people who I think who um, talk about uh, the deen and about like Islam and fiqh and all these things. I'm, I'm like, in a way, I'm not saying they're experts on the heart, but they deal in matters of the heart in that respect. Right. Um, like for me, I, I because I deal with matters of the mind, the way we think about things. In the last few years, I would say I've matured a lot in how I talk about things because I've become a lot more cognizant of the fact that I hold a platform that actually has, and I have a much bigger platform than maybe I'd like to actually have in some ways. Like there are days when I just kind of want to write stuff, throw it out there and like go into a cocoon and be like, okay, hopefully it has an impact. And, you know, um, but because I have this, this, this platform, you have to use it responsibly and you have to understand that it has an impact on people's minds. And so, um, you know, I, I, and so that because of my own position and because like my, I, me having some friends who are, who would be considered, you know, Shayuk and whatnot, I am able to make that separation. And also you have to, you have to make that separation, as I mentioned earlier, because when you start seeing these things again and again, um, you know, things are happening in our community that are unfortunate. If, if you don't make those separations, then you will see like, well, this is what Islam is. And honestly, like almost every person that I know who has left Islam or is on the precipice of leaving Islam, it's not because they're like, well, I don't know if I believe in God or I don't know if I believe in, um, you know, the, the message of the Prophet Sallam. It's the people. Right. It's because they've seen, I, you know, they've seen, you know, they were, they were, they were in a, in a Islamic school. Like they were, they were, you know, learning, they were memorizing the Quran and they saw their, their, they found out that their, their teacher, their beloved teacher who was teaching them the Quran and to memorize it was having an affair. Right. And that broke their, their, their faith. And yeah, objectively, we might be like, well, that your faith should not be in people. It should be in Islam. But we forget like the power of human relationships and what they mean, right? Especially on an individual level. And so when you as a Muslim woman, for instance, like, you know, people talk about how Muslim, like uh, the, the, we have a huge rate of, of women who convert to Islam. What we don't talk about is we have a huge turnover too, right? Like we have a lot of women who leave Islam. And the reason isn't because they're like Islam in and of itself is a terrible religion and it doesn't respect women. No, it's because of their experiences that mm -hmm. they have. And it's like at some point, everyone has a breaking point, right? And may, may we all be blessed with an iman that doesn't break, but we're not all blessed with that, right? And everyone has, I mean, even like the Sheikh al-Islam, right? Al-Ghazali had his doubts, right? Like we forget like that is part of his story as well. Mm, right. and, and, it's, and, it, and I don't think we actually talk about that part of his story. We talk about Imam Ghazali all the time, but we don't talk about how he, who, you know, a man who is considered probably for, at least for Sunni Islam, like the greatest scholar, right? We don't talk about how he had his doubts as well and what that meant for him, right? Those doubts for him that he had and what and how he had to, you know, like come back and so on and so forth. And it's so important to me that lesson because in that in that story is a lesson of there there is always there is room for you to come back also, right? Um and so yeah, I think we do to your point and to summarize and just to kind of end this point, um, is that we need, we need to, in order to maintain our faith and our community, we need to be able to separate the deen from those who teach it, it which is in a way sad, but we need to be able to do that. Correct. And I think equally important is a point that you raised, which is that at the same time, I think our scholars or those who who enjoy certain platforms uh, need to appreciate the fact that they do have those platforms and they need to, and, 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 and by result or as a result of that, they have a heightened responsibility in terms of what they put out there. So for example, it's very easy to say, well, I can take, certain knowledge from this scholar, but I'll leave off what he says about politics. Yeah, maybe yeah. some of us can do that, but a lot of us can't. And yeah. so hen hence, hence, it's easy to say, well, the scholar should swim in his lane or her lane. But at the same time, I think the I think there is a certain onus on scholarship or people who enjoy platforms as a result of that set scholarship 
to tread carefully in terms of what information that they're putting out there or what political opinions they're putting out there. So absolutely. And, and I think that, I mean, this is broader than any one episode of diffuse congruence. And so mm-hmm. I think we've, we, we, we've certainly, you know, th- I just want to try to the best of my ability to kind of tie in, tie up a lot of the loose ends that we've, that we've uncovered. I, I, so I think that's one point I want to make about, like this issue of scholars and scholarship in terms of, and then platforming and, and so on. I think that's a very important point. Um, I think also, you know, sign up probably as a way to kind of close out as we talk about platforms and individuals and the, and the, and the audiences that they enjoy and the, uh, and the responsibility that goes with that. What are certain, like, what are the, what are the negotiables and the non-negotiables, right? So for example, yeah, we can disagree with someone politically, but that person can still like that person doesn't have to be quote unquote canceled. That person doesn't have to, you know, be uh, deplatformed. So what are what would you say as a journalist or just as Sana Saeed are the negotiables and non-negotiables in terms of, uh, you know, people who enjoy the kind of platforms that people do enjoy in our communities? That's actually a really good question. It's a tough Whether it's question. scholars, yeah, it is a tough one. Whether it's scholars, whether it's people that we've talked about on the quote unquote ah right, or it's people yeah. that are on the other, you know, that are the, the, the part of the quote unquote political class. Like what right. what are negotiables, non negotiables? Well, I think for me it's also it comes down to there's a I come I'm I'm a huge believer in in like in the power of like principles. Right. And I'm very, I'm very non, I don't, I'm not very flexible on principles, right. I'm, I'm flexible on maybe political views on political, like I'm, I'm actually quite flexible on many things, but in terms of, I'm like, I believe in evolving and learning more and like my, like that's said, the other I, thing, right? right. The other thing is that none of us are, uh, should be represented to excuse, excuse me, exclusively represented by who we are in a certain moment in time. Right. Absolutely. And so, but at the same time, a major principle that I do live by is like, you know, cause no harm. And there you go, you know, and so when, so to me, like one of the things that's really non-negotiable is absolutely anything that is causing harm in a measurable way to our community. And that means you are part of a council, right? Which uh, of, of, of another country or the country that you live in, uh, which is creating material harm uh, for people, whether it's in this country or elsewhere, that to me, it's not like, Oh, I'm going to go cancel you. Right. Because you're not cancelable. First of all, like, you know, if you, if you hold a, especially if you're extremely powerful in this country, you're not going to be canceled. Right. But I'm, that doesn't mean I'm going to shut up. Right. And if that's all I can do, Perfect. That's all I will do. Right. Um, on a more smaller scale, you know, like it's funny because I just had this, I've been having this conversation a lot like influencers. Right. And I'm like, man, I don't have time to even think about Muslim influencers right now on social media. And like, just because there's, I'm like, it's so, I'm like, oftentimes it's a case of me disagreeing with them versus me saying like they're causing harm to our community. Right. Are they cause, are they part of like, I mean, the whole influencer thing, I think overall is very harmful to human beings in general and that's a whole other conversation. But to me, again, it comes down to, I'm more interested in those in our community who they may have the best of intentions. Don't get me wrong. Right. But like they say, right. Like the, the the road to hell is paved with good intentions sometimes, but like, um, you know, like, but is what you're doing causing us harm? Right. Like, uh, and that goes for anything. Like there were a lot of people who, you know, wanted to, to not to go into it in depth, but like, with the with CVE, right? Like uh, the Countering Violent Extremism Program. Th- I know people were like, "Well, if we get this money, then that means like other people who actually can damage our community uh, won't be getting this money, right?" And I'm like, "Yeah, but you're still engaging in propping up a program that is ultimately criminalizing our community and our basic practice as Muslims." So it's like for me, it's very important that we're talking about the principles at the core of what we're doing, right? It's not about political disagreement. Oh, I disagree with you because you have this political position. It's like, what is that the core principle that's actually being, um, uh, the, the principle that's being violated here. And so for me, a major, uh, principle, as I mentioned, is the do no harm. And that's what, that's a lot of what I live by. Got it. Got it. Would you, so yeah, that, so, so that becomes sort of the, uh, non-negotiable as it that's were, right? One, that's one of probably, that's probably the most non-negotiable one. And, and I say, and I honestly, like, I'm not even saying this to be like cute or funny or whatever, but like, I honestly believe like if at any point anyone thinks that I am, for instance, violating that 
principle that I am causing harm and it can be shown to me how I'm causing, I'm like, please tell me, like, I believe in that principle so much. And I've come to believe in it more, right. As I've grown older, like that is at the core of also like what I believe. Um, I'm like, you know, um, that like, if I am causing harm, I'm like, tell me, I want to know, like, I want to be also held accountable for what I'm putting out in the world because I know I have a massive platform yeah. and sometimes like, you know, like, look, I human beings are human beings, right? Like you say stupid things all the time. Like I say stupid things all the time and I'm cognizant of like, Sana, what did you just, you're, you're, you're like, that's a really stupid thing to say. Don't say it again type of thing. Right. But I also understand that sometimes like, you know, um, so like I said, I, if you want to hold me accountable, please do it. I am all for it. Absolutely. <laughs> no, I, I appreciate that, Sana. And I, and I think that's a really good place to kind of, or, or to tie to tie up a lot of the, uh, a lot of the issues that we did raise. I, I, uh, but before I let you go, I think it would also be, you know, just given the work that you do, like I, I rely on people like yourself, like as, as someone who is a journalist to, to, to help us as a community, how do we have these conversations in a way that is meaningful, like in a way that is led, that is less, I, I, sorry, not meaningful. That's that's the wrong word. I think all these conversations are meaningful, but c- c- give me like, again, just, I know this is like just catching you perhaps off guard, but like, what is a platform or some means by which we can have these conversations in a less chaotic fashion? Like social media isn't it. Twitter isn't it for me. Right. It's like, the, those, those those platforms aren't helping the situation. They're causing greater harm in terms of where we're having these conversations. So, what do you think, as again, as a journalist, like how, where where like what is a good place to have these conversations in a way where it's less chaotic? So, um, so two things. One, um, so this is going to sound it's, it sounds really archaic, but I think it actually and I think I, we actually tried organizing these in the Bay a couple of times and they were very successful. And I wish we had actually stuck with doing them. Um, but and, and again, I know it sounds so like, oh, really? But like town halls, like yeah. bring your community together, like your, right. your immediate community. And then guess what? If you want to have like, um, uh, you know, uh, want the rest of social media on it, live stream it. Say, hey, my community, we're going to be talking about this particular issue. We might take some uh, comments from the audience, right? Like, uh, or from like the online audience as well. And, you know, has, has, you know, and set it up in a way that's smart. You need a good mediator, right? You right. need someone who can actually, uh, or sorry, moderator, right? Who can mediate the conversation really well. You need um, people from all ends of the spectrum, right? And they need to agree that there will be decorum, that we will respect each other and that this is an open space. Um, you know, like things like that, like have a town hall that where people speak their mind as well, right? So that way you're having a very localized conversation with an ability to make it go outside. I feel like if more communities were doing this and talking with one another, A, you're building community and you're also seeing like, what are the people that you actually live with, the people you spend day to day with, the people who are in your community that you may not even know of, what are they thinking about, right? Like in, in, in particular, the Muslim issues, right? So Muslim commu- Muslim members of your community, like what are they thinking about? What are their questions? What are they confused about, right? That's one way to do it. Um, and uh, um, and because I, I think unfortunately what ends up happening, and, and I'm not a huge fan of it, is like we have a lot of these panels and it's like a lot of like the same people. It's the same people who are like kind of part of the political class or, or the expert class or whatever. And I'm like, we need to get beyond this because there are a lot of smart people who are everyday Muslims who are saying things we should be listening to. Absolutely. Like just because they don't have the institutional affiliation of a certain group or whatever does not mean they should not be listened to. So I think that's one way that we can start having really smart conversations. Um, and you, again, you can open it up to people um, outside of your community when you, when you live stream or something like that. I think there is a hunger for this. And I say, here's why, because I just down uh, last week, I, uh, not we, uh, when was it Wednesday, uh, uh, January 6th. So the day that the Capitol was formed, I downloaded clubhouse and I cannot tell you how much that platform has changed my life. Like I genuinely mean that again, I'm not being dramatic. Like it is a platform that, and especially the Muslims on it. Like, I feel like we definitely, I mean, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of cringe on there too, but it is a platform where I have been able to have some incredible conversations about these exact issues with people who are like-minded, not completely like-minded, debating, so on and so forth. And the way that it's, I think it comes down to having a good moderator. If you don't have a good moderator, the conversation is going to be awful, right? Yeah. Right. But 
if you have a really good moderator and you're really smart about who you allow to speak and like, you know, how you moderate people, question, answer, like all that stuff, someone who really knows the app as well, how to use it, et cetera, you can have some incredibly productive conversations, which elevate it from simply like this, like, you know, massive essays on Facebook. Right. And the thing <laughs> is, and the reason is, is because there's no video, it's all audio, right? Clubhouse is basically for, if, if you don't know what it is, it's an app where it's basically like the late nineties, early two thousands Yahoo chat rooms. You kind of create a room or whatever, and you go in. However, instead of typing, you're just speaking on your phone. If that's why my voice, if it sounds so like kind of rough, it's because I've been talking nonstop for like I a bet. week. And it's actually kind of amazing to have this in, in the midst of a pandemic for those of us who've, you know, stayed home and not seen anyone. Um, but, um, you know, it's, I, I'm meeting and talking with people who I have no idea who they are, but we're talking about issues in a very nuanced way that I did not think was possible online anymore. I really didn't think it was possible. And so I really recommend getting in on that just because it is, and I can send you guys invites if you're interested, because I do think you can moderate some great conversations on there and at least elevate it a bit more. Because here's the thing, when people are actually having to speak to you, right? Not like spending time on Google, making sure like everything is right or whatever. But when they're actually having time to speak with you, there's a lot less aggression, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot, and it's much more intimate, but there's also like, you don't have, um, what to call like, there's no video, right? So it's like, you don't have the awkwardness of video as well. So there's a, there's a, there's honesty that sometimes may not be there if you're face to face, but there's less aggression because you're actually, hearing someone's voice as opposed to just seeing text. So it's a lot more intimate. And I think it's a great platform um, in that regard. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing that. And then um, I guess any advice for for, for, for folks like us who, who's, who are running these podcasts? I think, um, you know, definitely speak to more journalists. Um, I think that always helps a lot. There are a lot of incredible Muslim journalists in our community, a lot of Muslim women journalists in our community who can tell you so much Mm. about what is happening in the community about like that you would be like what like because they are covering these issues they are following these issues i'm happy to always recommend them as well um and and so i would recommend that i'd also recommend um you know um well, a, actually, no, you do it right. Don't, don't give people questions beforehand. Actually, no, you do that. Like, don't, go, don't give people questions beforehand because that's a journalistic practice as well, which is that you don't give people then a chance to do PR. You know, I, I, and I appreciate you saying that. Um, but it's funny you say that because I, at the, on the one hand, I, 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 I want to maintain that as being a part of the show, which is that we have these very unscripted conversations. Um, but as this, I guess as a consumer of a lot of this media as well, I, I, I feel that I, I feel almost responsible for the fact that we're not giving nice little, you know, bow tie, you know, like tied in a bow of uh, conclusions, beginning ends and conclusions on any given issue. So, but I, so I, but that, that is something I struggle with, but I'm, I'm, I'm willing to live with because I think I, mean, I agree with you. I'll, that, I'll give you, I'll give you some free, free, this is, I usually charge. No, you, please. You know, but <laughs> I'll please. give you some free advice. Um, in that case, what I would say is that you can always do a follow-up episode um, in which you're like, which is literally, you make it 15 minutes, right? Really short and say, these were the major themes. This was some of the feedback we got. Let's tie up this. And maybe it could be 15 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever. And it's a follow-up episode with that person. If it was, especially if it got like a lot of like, you know, something like this, for instance, right? Where we got into so much right. and like it's so many different conversations and layers to it. And I'm sure people who listen are going to have a lot to say. So you can always just do that. So have this kind of auxiliary uh, content that exists on the side for these kind of major conversations where you're covering a lot and there's too many loose ends and there's no major conclusion. You can do that. Or what you can do is after recording with me, you guys, you know, you and Omar sit down and kind of maybe share your takeaways, right? Like what were our takeaways from this, right? Because you guys are the hosts, right? So the audience is coming in, not just to listen to who you're bringing on. They're coming into listening. Like they want to listen to what you have to say and what it is that you guys are taking away from a conversation. So you spend maybe 10, 15 minutes like, Oh yeah. Talking to Sana, like these were my major takeaways. I think it's really interesting. I think in my opinion, this is maybe a nice conclusion, right? As opposed to what's, what's my conclusion, because I don't have a conclusion on many things. I'm still figuring these things out. Right. right. And, and, and I'm still learning and trying to learn. And these conversations help me because when you ask me certain questions, I'm like, oh, I actually don't know. And it forces me to actually think about how do I articulate this? Correct. Thought, right? Correct. 
So right. maybe, so those would be the two recommendations I was, I would have. So this is uh, on the house this time, next time it won't be on the house, but uh, on the house, <laughs> some, uh, some production advice in terms of like how to Huge. Uh, give your, give your uh, uh, audience or consumers some, some, uh, you know, conclusions. Thank you. Uh, hugely appreciate the uh, the free tip, and uh, <laughs> and at the same time, you kind of uh, sort of leaving the door open to return to the show um, at some future point. But uh, uh, Senna, I know you've done a lot of these, and I want to thank you again um, uh, for you know uh, agreeing to be on the show for uh, what I think is you know uh, probably one of our most sort of vulnerable and open and honest conversations about a lot of the issues that we've touched on in the past but haven't really gone into so although I may feel even now like we haven't maybe concluded or given you know uh, conclusions on the issues that we did explore, I feel like we did have a very honest and vulnerable and open uh, and engaging conversation. So I, I want to, again, thank you for that from the bottom of my heart. And uh, Sana, before we let pe- you know our, our guests go, we always ask, like, where can people find you online? Anything you want to plug? Um, please feel free to do that. And I, I promise our listeners that we'll have Sana back on a future episode to either wrap this one up or just to maybe uh, go delve into other topics as well. So yeah, just, I would love, uh, I would definitely love to be back. Yeah, just echoing uh, the gratitude. We went over time. We uh, expanded <laughs> a lot of the top uh, topic areas, and uh, you know it, it was it was really really uh, really interesting and, and uh, a good time as well. So I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you both, by the way, so much for um, providing this platform. This is definitely one of like, a, it's a really good conversation, and um, I think maybe because we share like you know the the much background like there's a lot that we could actually share in terms of like oh yeah and whatnot um and then also i will say i think you guys really really lucked out because um i'm not i think most people who follow me as well i'm not very i don't really like to not like like to i just don't share vulnerabilities because um i have seen that used against me in some ways in the past from our community unfortunately Uh, and also just because like i want the i don't want the focus ever to be on me like i'm like i'm just I'm just a conduit, right? To use a previous term. I'm just a person who's trying to get a message across. It's not about me. But I will say that I, because of these conversations I've been having on Clubhouse and because like, I think there's been an allowance of vulnerability with strangers as well. It's like reminded me of just how much of a power there is in vulnerability in storytelling of yourself. Like I, I know that obviously as a journalist, when I'm covering stories that vulnerability of like your subjects and whatnot, absolutely is powerful storytelling. But I forgot that like, sometimes you really do need to, when you're telling your own story, like people, because I, and I think like I, I, one of the things I've struggled with another moment of vulnerability is that people see me sometimes, and I know this because they tell me this um, after when we become friends or something, but um, they say like, oh, well, you know, you, you seem really like mean. You seem really like aggressive, which I'm like, interesting terms to use for a woman. Okay. Um, which is funny because I'm like, if you actually know me, I'm like, none of those things. I'm actually like, not at all like that. And so I think like, for me, it's, I think it's, it's a way of also being like, Hey, like I'm, I'm just like a person. That's like, right. I <laughs> I'm think just a person you, doing something here. That's it. Um, we all yeah. are. We all are. Yeah, right? we that's, all that, are. that was we one of the big takeaways. That's the takeaway. There you go. There's the big takeaway. We're all just people doing things, trying to make it through this life. Thank um, you. Thank and, you. And, and as to where you can find me, you can find me on Twitter at Sana Saith. You can find me on Facebook at Sana Saith. I'm actually on a hiatus on fr- from both those for the time being for my own mental health. Um, I'm also on Instagram as Sana Face. Uh, and I'm also on Clubhouse as Sun of Face, um, and where I'm actually trying to hold more conversations, uh, interesting conversations on on Clubhouse. So, yeah. Great. Uh, and we are, like I said, we were delighted to have you. And, you know, it's, it's funny. One of the things that you did say about j- j- just that opportunity to be vulnerable. I mean, one of the one of the compliments that we've gotten from guests, of course, we, you know, we, we always appreciate the comment and comments and the feedback we get from listeners, but from our guests has been like later, like after an episode airs is, you know, I've had people come up to me and say, you know, well, you know, you've never, you've, you've never shared that part of you or you've never shared that story. So 
I mean, and again, we're just conduits. Um, whether it's I mean, me you guys, you guys got my wild halak. And there you go. Khan that's what story. I mean. Like that's crazy, man. <laughs> like you don't even know. Like I never shared the halak story except with very close friends. So like, there's a blessing, and I think I, I, I really truly believe it, it comes from Allah. Like it comes from God. Like we yeah. just have been, we're just a conduit. But there is something about the format of the show, or just the show in general, or the way we're able to kind of have these conversations where people do tend to be vulnerable, and and we're always I'll appreciated it. Uh, we always take that as like an amana, as a trust. So I'll say also this is that, you know, mashallah, you guys are very talented at what you do because it's not easy to interview people. And what you allow is you allow the speaker to work through their thoughts versus like jumping at them constantly in different ways. And like, what about this? What about this? What about this? And interviewing, by the way, is an art form. It's not some, by the way, like I'm not a great interviewer. Like, let me be clear. Like I, uh, it's, 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 it's really an art form that I think you have to build yourself. It takes practice. And I think you guys do a fantastic job of like, and also you are very good at taking cues in conversation that like, instead of bringing it back to where you want to go, you're like, wait a second. And this is the a hallmark of a good interviewer, which I think is very important is that instead of being like, no, no, we want to get back to what we want to talk about. You're like, wait, this conversation is going in this way. You need, you think on your feet and you go with it. Right. And of course, then you do bring it back. Like when there's a particular point you want to bring, you do bring that back. So you guys are actually good at what you do. Uh, you can use this in your like little, like, you know, promo, like, look at That's that. Right. <laughs> but no, you guys are really good at what you do. And, and, and interviewing is just because someone has a podcast doesn't mean they're a good interviewer. Interviewing is a true art form. And it's something that I think if anyone is getting into podcasting, if you want to be in journalism, you know, it is an art form that you need to study and really just practice. It comes down to practicing and the conversations you're having in your life as well. I cannot tell you what a huge compliment that is, right, Omar? I mean, it's you're, actually a compliment. It's no, a compliment. no, it's huge. You're, you're, you're talking to a lawyer and an engineer. Who are, <laughs> we have no training in this. So for you to say that, Sana, that is just, that is the hugest endorsement. And yeah. There's we'll, the reason why I was like, I stayed longer, right? Because I'm like, wait, this is actually a really, you it's actually, beneficial for me. It's beneficial for me as well. Thank you. No, you actually had somewhere to be and you, and you pushed that back, uh, to, 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 to stay on the show longer. So huge, huge compliment. And, and I take that to heart. So thank you so much. Um, thank you. yeah. And, and, and yes, I, we will definitely try to use that some way, somehow, some, in some <laughs> form or fashion in a, in a, in a promo. Um, but again, uh, speaking of promos, uh, folks, you can always reach out to us. Um, you can send us an email, feedback, comments, questions, diffuse congruence at gmail.com. You can hit us up on facebook.com slash diffuse congruence. As always, if you like the show, you can become a patron by going to patreon.com slash diffuse congruence. We're also on Twitter and what have you. So thank you as always for listening. And we look forward to uh, catching you next time on the next episode of diffuse congruence. Thank <laughs> you.